Okay. So let's let's run through the activities we're going to do today. Uh, there's quite a bit. Today's a busy one for sure. I may have been a little bit ambitious, so we may have to bump some of this stuff till tomorrow. I'll I'll have to we'll have to make a call on that later. We'll we'll see how far we, this. It's mostly dependent on how long the dissection takes. So I think I can do it in an hour. We'll we'll give it a shot. I, I don't want to rush it too much, otherwise you're not going to see anything. But um, okay, so today's day fourteen. So we're going to start off talking um, about the regulation of your sinus rhythm. That's like your, the electrical activity of your heart. So we're going, to, we're going to complete the note that you received yesterday, um, which would be uh, this note right here. So we're going to start with this, uh, talk a little bit about the special locations of the heart with regards to electrical activity, how to read an ECG, um, and then... Uh, we're going to go do a little uh, Google Slides slash show together talking about some illnesses of the circulatory system. So we're going to talk about atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, myocardial infarction, stroke, all those different sort of like ailments of the circulatory system and how they work. Um, I left an extra uh, video here at the bottom. This is just like purely for your interest. If you're really interested in ECG reading, um, you're planning on going to the field of medicine and nursing or if you want to become a physician or something like that. This is sort of just like an intro guide to, to ECGs, like to reading them, because there's a little bit more nuance than what we're going to talk about in class. Um, but it's, it's kind of cool because there's a lot you can tell by just looking at the electrical activity of the heart. Uh, I should have brought my little book in with me. I have all my medical textbooks for my brother. Um, but there's like a whole giant textbook on reading ECGs because there's a lot you can diagnose about heart problems just by looking at that little electrical feed. So... Um, anyway, if you're interested, I put a little extra video in there. In the second part of the first block, I have no idea whether we're actually going to get to that in the second half of the first block. We're going to shoot for it. Uh, we're going to do fetal pig dissection. I did link the fetal pig dissection from the textbook, so you can follow along if you want. But I'm going to be sort of like abbreviating that a little bit. So I'm not going to follow the exact procedure from the textbook, but I'll make sure that I hit all the important stuff. Really, the key for the fetal pig dissection is we've talked about three body systems, digestive, respiratory, and circulatory. And all of the key parts of those systems, I'm going to show you what they look like in a pig. That's, basically, that's the purpose of it. So we're not going to really spend a lot of time on the external anatomy and like a bunch of other stuff that you don't really do when you guys do the dissection, just because just really not that important for this course. So, but we are going to focus on the three systems that are uh, in the curriculum for this course. In block two, and again, this may run sort of towards the end of block two. We might work on this tomorrow as well. I'll have to see what the timing is like. You guys are going to start uh, your medical technology presentation. The idea behind this, just in super brief, is that you're going to select a medical technology. You can pick any medical technology you like that is used to either diagnose or treat an illness. But ideally, you're going to pick one that's for diagnosing or treating an illness of the circulatory, respiratory, or digestive system. That's pretty, pretty broad because, uh, I mean, that, that covers a lot. So it doesn't have to be one that we've specifically covered as an illness, but it can be like really anything that you'd like that's uh, associated with one of those systems. Uh, and then some, some of the technologies that you might pick might have more than one system associated with or more than one illness, in which case there's some stuff in the instructions for that, but we'll, we'll get to that later. But anyway, if you, just, you can even start thinking about it now. If you have a particular medical technology you're interested in, ultrasound, biophotonics, um, cobalt radiation therapy, whatever, you know, just pick something. could be really anything, any medical device, okay? Um, and then during learning block three, there's the quiz. It's 53 marks. I increased the time limit from two hours to two and a half hours. I had my partner write it, which is kind of unfair because she's a doctor, but I, I had to write it just to test what the timing was like. Yeah, I guess that's really not fair at all, eh? I didn't, I didn't have anyone else on hand. My son's five, so I couldn't get him to write it. But, um, but it took her about 15 minutes, so I guess I, I don't think that's probably indicative of how long it'll take you. But uh, I don't know. Two and a half hours should be plenty of time. I'm not really worried about the time limit. So, um, but it is open book, okay? 
So I do ask maybe some level of detail questions that I probably wouldn't have asked in a written test, but yeah, you have everything open to you, right? You don't flip over to your notes that you've taken. You can find most of this information pretty quickly, I would assume. As long as you have a general idea of your notes, uh, you pro you're probably good. So um, just as a heads up, that's happening in Learning Block 3. You can write it anytime you want. It doesn't have to be right at the beginning of Learning Block 3. You can write it, um, I guess, technically right before midnight. I would really strongly recommend that you write it today because after today we're just going to be moving on to something else and then you're not going to want to like have this as something that's hanging over your head or something you need to do so i would just i would blast it out today but like today tomorrow at the very latest i, I wouldn't leave it otherwise you're going to start falling behind so just as a heads up okay and then so that's during learning block three so let, i'm going to get started here let's talk about regulation of the heart that's where we're headed today hopefully we'll get all that done i think we will This is the heart. <laughs> we talked about the parts of the heart yesterday, so I'm going to be referring to some of them right now. But the most important thing that I want to talk about right now is this, the idea of electrical activity. So just like your muscles, oh, we didn't talk about muscle either. Let's talk about why there is electrical activity in the heart in general. So what's actually happening when a muscle contracts, I'm just going to kind of do this as an aside, is if you can imagine the cell membrane. Okay, so this is like the cell membrane of a muscle cell. And do you guys remember this from from last year when you talked about the four types of tissue that muscle cells are like this long cell that has more than one nucleus in it. Does this sound familiar at all? What does a muscle cell do? What's the purpose of it? It's one of the four tissues. What's just the general function of a muscle tissue or a muscle cell? To move, right? It gets shorter. Really, all it can do is get shorter. That's all it does. So if you were to look at the heart, if you were to just like take a cross section out of the heart tissue, just like blow it up, what you would notice, if I can do a circle, ooh, very nice. What you would notice is that instead, in, in regular muscle tissue, like in your bicep or something like that, all the fibers are running in the same direction. Because what you want for your, your bicep, it's attached down here and it's attached up here. You just want that to get shorter to move this closer to this. That's all that it does, right? But in the heart, you don't want the heart to just get shorter this way or shorter this way, like in one direction, right? You, you kind of want it to shrink to like get smaller in every direction when it contracts. So instead of having all the fibers running in one direction in the heart, you actually have fibers kind of running all over the place. So you got fibers going this way and fibers going this way, and fibers going this way, inside the heart. These are kind of all overlapping each other. And so when they contract, that the heart muscle kind of just shrinks. It gets smaller in every direction. That's one of the reasons by why um, if you've ever eaten heart meat, anybody ever had heart before? <laughs> you can buy it from the butcher. It's not very popular. Um, but it's extremely tough. It's really tough meat because the muscle fibers are going in every direction. So when you try and like chew it, it's like all like, it's really tough. So it's not a super popular meat to eat. It is edible, but it's not really great to eat. So it's got these fibers that go in every direction so that it gets smaller. And, and what you want a muscle fiber to do, if you just look at one single cell, there are a bunch of these long proteins inside. And there are a second set of proteins that run in between these proteins. And if you zoom in on those, what, what is actually happening at the molecular level is when you tell the muscle to contract, this fiber right here, it has some little things on the end of it that actually walk the fiber this way down the fiber. It pulls the fiber in and it'll do it in both directions. So the other end here is gonna pull this part in. And then as you go down the line in the entire fiber, as these proteins are getting pulled together, they actually make the cell shorter so they can, you know, 
And in that process, they use a whole bunch of ATP, which is why the, that, the main consumers of energy in your body are your muscle cells and your neurons, but muscle consumes a huge amount. Okay, so that's the general purpose of the muscle cell. It gets shorter. So in order to get it shorter, make, activate that whole sequence of events, you have to give a signal to the cell to tell it to do that. And really interestingly, your muscles use electricity to signal. That's how it works. And the same thing with your nerves. They send an electrical signal. So what they're doing is they have some sodium inside. Oh, that's too big. Let's go smaller. You guys remember what the char charge is on sodium ions? In group one. One plus. Awesome. Okay, and then you've got these pumps along the surface of the cell that pump sodium. Okay? So what the cell does when it's at rest is it pumps sodium into the cell. All right. If you take a bunch of positive things and move them inside of the cell, this is this is. And I'm going to ask you to go back to your uh, grade nine. <laughs> good luck. Great grade nine electricity unit. Okay. If I pump sodium into the cell, I have more positive ions on this side of the cell than on the other side. What's going to be the net charge inside the cell if I do that? What would it be? It will be positive, right? I'm going to end up with a big old positive charge inside the cell. That's a positive electrical charge, okay? If you move positive ions in, this is electrically charged positive, like the positive terminal of a battery, okay? That's the same thing. There's no difference here between those two things. And there's also going to be a net charge on the outside of the cell, which is what? If it's net positive inside, What's the relative charge on the outside going to be? Negative. negative. Okay, you guys know this. You're just being quiet. Okay, cool. So we've got positive on the inside and negative on the outside. That's an electrical charge. Okay, we've actually created a static electrical charge over this cell. And you can read a static electric charge with a probe. If you put an electrical probe on that, just like you guys use the, um, the voltmeters in grade 9, yeah? You can measure a voltage across the cell. There is an electrical charge going across this cell. So if you actually like straight up take a voltmeter and place it on the surface of the muscle, you can read this. You can see the voltage difference across. Okay? So what we're looking at when we're looking at an ECG tracing, which we're going to get to in a second, right here, is a, is a measurement of that, where this is positive voltage towards the top, and then at the bottom we have negative voltage. Okay, net positive and net negative. So we're actually reading the electrical activity, the voltage at the heart. All right. Conversely, if you take an electric current or you take a static electric charge and you discharge it into muscle, you can activate the muscle co contraction by using an electrical current because you are just simulating this is what you're doing okay so if you I know we don't do this lab anymore but if you take like a dead frog and you put a little current across it you can make its leg kick or um, what would be an example of something that you guys have seen oh if you've ever seen somebody be electrocuted by an electric fence when you get electrocuted it causes your muscles to contract and kind of throws your hand back when you anybody touch an electric fence before nobody's done it okay it's probably not a good idea anyway but anyway this causes your muscles to contract okay so these things are related to each other so in order to actually signal the contraction, what happens is um, it will get a stimulus telling it to contract, okay, so by a nerve, and then these are going to leave through these channels, okay, they're going to get released. So that's called a depolarization because it went from being polar to being not polar, okay, charge gone. <laughs> that's a depolarization. That is the signal that tells all of the little proteins inside to contract and get shorter, okay? And it cycles. So once it depolarizes, 
these pumps are going to activate and they're going to pump the ions back across the border. Whoops, a daisy. And they're going to repolarize the cell and make this a positive charge again and this a negative charge. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit oversimplifying this, but that's, that's the basics of what it is, okay? So it's pumping charged particles across the membrane to depolarize and repolarize, and that's what's activating the actual muscle contraction. It's a series of letting stuff go across the border. Okay, that's the basics. So when we're looking at the heart, and like I said, we can measure this depolarization and repolarization of the heart muscle tissue, and by looking at that measurement of the electrical activity, we can learn a lot about what is actually happening in the heart. So first, I want to talk a little bit about then what is the electrical activity in the heart and how does it actually contract? So the signal to contract, that depolarization signal to get stuff going, always starts in the same spot on the heart. Okay? It's a little patch right here on the top of the right atrium. And that area right there is called the SA node. And SA, I should probably write what SA stands for. SA is sinoatrial. but it's almost always just referred to as SA node. This is the sinoatrial node. This also happens to be where your nerves are connected to your heart. So you have an, a nerve that's attached here. That nerve is called the vagus nerve. And that's going to go to your spinal cord and then to your brain. Okay? So you do have some direct nervous control of your heart. That's handy because that means that your brain can control your heart rate a little bit. It's not fully autonomous. So if you are walking along in the hall and you look up a flight of stairs, Okay, this is kind of cool. You can measure this. Subconsciously, your body is going to receive the signal. Your brain is going to receive the signal. We're about to climb some stairs. And even without any participation on your part, your heart rate will increase to prepare your body for the stress of climbing stairs. It will increase the amount of blood that you're going to transport to your muscles. It actually causes vasodilation in your legs as well increasing the amount of blood flow to your leg muscles. This is before you even start climbing the stairs to prep your body, which is really cool. And this, this is all happening autonomically. So this happens at a subconscious level. But you can do that because this nerve is attached from your brain to your heart, telling your heart, well, get ready, get ready. We're about to increase the stress level here and we need some more uh, cellular respiration happening. Okay, so there is some neural control of the heart. It's interesting because you do not need that nerve. The vagal nerve, it, co it comes down, goes through a rib from your brain. It's e it gets separated fairly easily. Actually, not through a rib. It comes in up here, uh, below your clavicle. So this is a nerve that has a tendency to get uh, severed during car accidents. Really intense uh, chest trauma. You get hit really hard in the chest. But if you sever the nerve, don't worry. This whole system in the heart operates completely independently of the brain. So you don't need this nerve. Now, if you sever it, you're going to lose some of your nervous control of your heart. In other words, now when you look up the stairs, you don't preemptively get an increase in your heart rate. Oh, well. So it's not great. It loses, you lose a little bit of efficiency there. But this system in the heart, the electrical system, runs completely independently of that. So it doesn't matter. So I'm going to go through now the sequence of events that causes your heart to beat, and so therefore, that's why your heart looks, its beat looks the way it looks, okay? So the signal is gonna start at the top of the atrium. Maybe I'll use blue here to show this. And so it's gonna send an electrical signal across to the other atria, okay? This is to the right atrium. 
And then from there, there is a depolarization that goes down through both atriums. Okay? So the atriums contract from top to bottom. It's a wave of electrical depolarization. So as one muscle cell contracts, that electrical signal activates the muscle cell beside it, which activates the muscle cell beside it, which activates the muscle cell beside it, and it travels in a wave across the surface of the tissue. So that's, a, that's called a depolarization wave. So you get that depolarization, and then the atriums contract. What's the function of the atriums? Does anybody remember what they do from yesterday? What's their purpose? You want to take a shot at it? Sure. They are collecting it and then doing what with it when they contract? Where do they push it? Yeah, you absolutely got it. Into the ventricle. So their job is to fill the ventricle. So the first part of the heart's contraction is the top parts of the heart, the atriums, contracting and filling the ventricle. Okay? So this, that happens first. You fill the ventricle from both tops. Then this electrical activity travels back to the center of the heart. Okay? And it travels down through the septum. This is like a little pathway in the heart that is the most electrically active. And it's really important that this electrical activity is coordinated because you want everything to happen at the right time. If it gets out of sequence and things start pumping out of sequence, then you get backflow and you get all kinds of crazy things happening in your heart when things aren't in proper sequence. That's why some people have pacemakers because their heart gets out of sequence and you can reset the heart by giving it in a little, a little electrical charge, a little zzz. <laughs> So if you zap it, you can get this whole process back into sequence again. That's what a pacemaker does. Okay, so if you have a problem with your sequencing in your heart. So now you've sent that electrical signal down the septum. The septum is not really muscle. It is muscle, but it's not really actively contracting. Okay? It's really just a pathway for electrical activity. It's the outsides now of the ventricles that are going to now contract from the bottom up. Okay? And now you're going to get a wave of muscle contraction pushing stuff up. Now remember from our diagram that we want the blood to exit the ventricles up. Okay? The exit from the ventricles is at the top. So it makes sense that you'd want to squeeze from the bottom. This is just like squeezing a tube of toothpaste. You want to squeeze the tube from the bottom of the toothpaste, not the top, so that you get everything out of the tube. This is the same thing. You want to get all the blood out of the heart, so you've got to squeeze it from the bottom. Okay? So you get this wave of depolarization traveling up the ventricles, and both ventricles contract at the same time, and they push blood up and out of the heart. The left side is going to push blood to the body, and the right side is going to push blood to the lungs. And then, once you get there, you've depolarized the entire heart. There is a rest where all of those ions get pumped back across the muscle membrane, and then you do it again. But you always have to coordinate it, and you always have to start the signal in the same place. So it's really, really important that the signal only starts here, and it always goes through this perfect procession of events. As soon as you get stuff off track, you get all kinds of heart problems going on. So you need this to happen. So the reason I mention this is what we're going to do now is look at that ECG lead, that reading of the ECG, and we're going to line up the little blips on the ECG, next time you watch some medical drama or whatever, you can tell what you're looking at here, to what is actually happening in the heart. Okay? So I'm going to just write here um, below what is actually happening. So we have, uh, I'm going to, I'll number this. I'll call this part one. Two, and then we'll call the this part three. Oh, I forgot about the AV node. That's the other important part.
So I forgot about one of the other nodes. The signal starts at the SA node, the sinoatrial node, but the AV node is this part right in the middle, right here, where the two signals come back together. It's, like I said, it's really important that all of this is coordinated. So the job of the AV node is if these two signals do not arrive at that spot at exactly the same time, they allow a slight delay for everything to line up. Okay, That way it will only send one signal down to the apex of the heart. You can't have that signal happening twice in a row or the muscle will start twitching. So you have to have this perfectly timed and the AV node allows that signal to be perfectly timed. It only allows one strong signal to be sent down to the apex of the heart. That's the AV node, atrioventricular node. Any questions about this so far? It's a little bit complicated, I guess. Okay, so I'm just gonna really quickly talk about this. So I'm gonna number it. So part one, So the SA node initiates a contraction from the top of the right atrium. It travels across the heart and down through both atria. That's part one. Part two. And then I guess number four would just be the muscle relaxes and resets. You guys good? Yeah. Okay. 
So let's look at our ECG read down here. So again, this is a measurement of the electrical activity in the heart. Um, so as things are becoming more negative or more positive, that is what we're registering here with our electrical leads. I think if you have the new Apple Watch, which is kind of cool, you, it actually you can take an ECG reading from your hand. So it's measuring the, the electrical depolarization from your wrist, which is kind of cool. I've heard that it works fairly well, actually, which is pretty amazing. Usually one lead ECG, which is when there's only a single electrical probe, doesn't work super well, but they must have found a way to make it work well. So um, anyway, so each of the parts of the wave are labeled with letters. Now that you guys have seen what is actually happening during a heartbeat, you might be able to figure out just from looking at this, remember that it's in sequence, what might be happening at each of these parts, okay? So imagine that there's no electrical activity in the heart, nothing's happening, no beating occurring, and then you see a little whoop. What's the first thing that happens? Going back to the sequence of events. What depolarizes first? What are the first things to contract in the heart? The SA node, which initiates the contraction of the two little guys on top. I don't remember the name. It's okay, atriums. Atria, right? So this is the atrial contraction here. Both atriums are contracting more or less at the same time. So the P wave, it's called the P wave, is atrial contraction. Color should be easier, maybe red. So P is atrial contraction. So when you're looking at an ECG lead, you are watching the electrical activity of the atrium in that little blip before the um, actual contraction of the ventricles, which is the next part. So the QRS complex, that's the big thing that you see. That's the boop <laughs> that makes the sound. Okay, so the QRS, this thing right here, QRS, is the big depolarization of the big muscly part of the heart, which is what? It's the part that really does the pumping. The bottom part of the heart. The this, oh, going down the septum is actually not a contraction. That's just sending the electrical sing signal to the apex. But once it gets to the apex, it's going to contract like the big beefy parts of the heart to send blood out, right? Which are what? What are the big things at the bottom? The apex is the tip. That's just like the point at the bottom of the heart. Do you remember what those two chambers are called? The big ones that do all the pumping? Ventricles. Okay, so this is the contraction of the ventricles right here. And actually during this time, during the QRS, the um, atrium are actually repolarizing. So they're getting ready to beat again. But because the QRS complex is so big, it actually kind of hides the repolarization of the atriums. So you, you can't actually see the electrical activity. Remember that because it's pumping those ions across to reset everything, that's an electrical thing too. That actually is a change in voltage. But you can't really see it on here. It gets hidden in the QRS complex. So you can't see the atrium repolarizing. So you can see the atrium contracting. You can see the ventricles contracting. Then there's a slight delay, and then there's this thing at the end. It's not a contraction, so the, the contraction part of the heart is done. So what, what would that be at the end there? The other electrical activity. Anyone want to hazard a guess? No? This is the reset, okay? So this is where the heart is repolarizing, the ventricles are repolarizing, getting ready to contract again. So that's called a T wave.
And this entire thing happens very quickly, less than a second. Well, way less than a second, less than a tenth of a second, really. It's pretty fast. So by looking at this, looking at this read, you can tell a lot by the, about the health of the muscle tissue in the heart. So for example, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna use some basic examples, and you don't need to know this, by the way, you're not gonna be diagnosing anybody with an ECG right now, but, but just in basic, why this is so useful and important. If you're looking at an ECG read of somebody, and instead of seeing a nice big T wave, you just see a little teeny T wave. Or instead of seeing the T wave here, which is like a certain amount of time after the QRS complex, what if your T wave is like way over here, like super far away? So when you see things like that, that means that there's a problem with the repolarization of your heart muscle tissue. That, that usually happens when it's not getting enough oxygen. So there's a great indication of somebody having an MI, a heart attack, which is that their heart muscle is beating it's contracting, but then when it's trying to reset at the end, your heart muscle's like, oh, I don't have enough oxygen. Oh, I can't repolarize to like way over here. Okay, this is take, the reset is taking a really long time before the heart muscle can contract, contract again. So you can learn a lot by seeing this, uh, this electrical activity. Same thing with like the P wave. You might get, oh, here, oh, here, hey, oh, I got a great one. You guys can even figure out what this means. What if you see this? That's called a split P wave. What do you think that means? Take a shot at it. Exactly. You don't have your two atria contracting at the same time. They are no longer in sync with each other. Okay? So, and that's hugely problematic. That means that the electrical activity of your heart is all over the place. So you have some kind of electrical conductivity problem in your heart. Your two atria are no longer contracting at the same time, okay? So even just like having some, some basic knowledge of what the ECG means, you can already do a lot. You guys could do a lot just by looking at this, okay? It's, it's not like super cryptic or anything like that to read. One more thing I want to mention, which is something that you see in like TV all the time, is if your ECG read looks like this. What's going on there? I see this in TV shows and movies and stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Somebody's in the hospital and then their, their ECG is just like going cuckoo bananas. Anyone want to take a shot at that? Uh, that would be if your brain activity looked like that. And you can measure the depolarization of your brain cells as well. Um, totally different test. but. But absolutely, that is also measurable. But not, not in your heart, though. This is called uh, ventricular fibrillation. Oh, 1B. Uh-oh. Don't want to misspell this. I'm pretty sure there's 1B. Fibrillation. Yep, 1B. Also. So ventricular fibrillation, also known as V-fib, what do you think is actually happening to the ventricle when it's in V-fib, when it's doing this? <laughs> I don't want to take a shot. So this is just muscle twitching, okay? When your heart is in V-fib, when your ventricles are just twitching and not doing anything, what do you think is happening to you? What do you think? 
Uh, the heart attack can cause this. Absol absolutely, it can. So this could be um, due to a heart attack, due to an MI. We're going to talk exactly what a heart attack is a little bit later today, but 100% can cause this. So do you think it's pumping blood? So this is where you get out the great Hollywood device known as the de defibrillator. This is where you use your defibrillator. Get the paddles out, okay? So when the heart is doing this, if you give it a big shock, what that does is it depolarizes all of the heart muscle tissue all at the same time. It's one big depolarization. So hopefully, once that happens, the heart will start one single coordinated contraction after that again. That's the idea. That's what you're hoping for, is that it's going to reset and start doing a regular coordinated contraction after a defibrillation. Okay, so this, this is where you want to use the defibrillator. The one thing that really gets me is in movies, the time when they use the defibrillator is always this time. So then you get your little random signal, and then you just get like a boop. So this, what's happening here, is nothing, okay? This is the heart muscle no longer contracting at all. What do you think a defibrillator does when you shock that? This is zero electrical activity in the heart. What do you think it does? It does nothing, guys. <laughs> it does nothing. You can't do anything when somebody has totally seceded all of their electrical activity in the heart. You can do CPR, and then when you do CPR, you hope to perfuse the heart tissue with some blood, and maybe it will begin some type of sinus rhythm or even fibrillation, so you can use your defibrillator. But when you have zero electrical activity in the heart, none at all, the defibrillator doesn't do anything. And in almost every TV show, when they use the defibrillator, it's when nothing is happening in the heart. It's after they flatlined. This is not when you use a defibrillator. I don't know what, how this got in some Hollywood writer's head that this is where a defibrillator is used, but it's in literally every single show that uses a defibrillator. They wait till somebody flatlines. That does not make any sense. So you don't, that's not what you do. Just as a heads up. And you, you guys have probably seen the AEDs, the automatic defibrillators around the school. There's a couple, and there's one near the office. There's one at phys ed. So what they do is it's a defibrillator, but it also reads the electrical activity of the heart and looks for this. It looks for fibrillation. If it finds fibrillation, then it automatically shocks the person. That's how it works. But if it detects a normal sinus rhythm like this, it does not shock the person, okay? That's why the automatic defibrillator is actually extremely useful if you don't know what you're doing because you don't want to shock somebody who has a normal sinus rhythm. Okay, maybe they're just unconscious or something like that. So the, the AEDs actually work really well because they don't accidentally shock these people and they also don't shock these people, okay? Because these people can't be helped by a defibrillation either. So I just wanted to point that out because that, that's one of the things that really bothers me. Okay, I don't know why it bothers me so much. Last thing I want to mention with regards to heart stuff. Uh, oh, two, uh, I got three more things, three more things. I'll be quick. Uh, where does the sound come from? Question. The screen for us. Of course it did. Why wouldn't it? Sorry, people at home. One second. Thank you. Okay, heart sounds. You guys have heard the classic heart sound, right? So really in brief here, what's actually happening? What are you hearing when you're hearing the heart sounds? You're hearing valve slap, okay? You're not actually hearing the heart pump. It doesn't make any sound at all when it's contracting. What you're hearing is valves slapping closed. So, the atrium's pump, they start first, right? We talked about the sequence of events here. So both atrium are going to pump 
and send blood down into the ventricle, right? And then they stop pumping and blood is going to fall back against these valves right here, okay? These are the AV valves and those valves are going to snap shut. When they snap shut, it makes a sound, blub, okay? Then the ventricles are going to pump. This is the bigger pump. Blunt, whoa, too big. Not that big. Calm down. That's still too big. There we go. Pump, pump, okay? The ventricles are going to pump, and then blood is going to fall back again against these valves. That's the bicuspid and the tricuspid, right? So when they fall back against those valves, those valves snap shut and they go dump. So the lub dub is one valve, sh the two valves, uh, these two valves right here. Oh. Okay. So one over here is the lub. And two is right here when these valves shut. That's the dub. So then the cycle repeats over and over. Lift up, lift up, lift up, lift up. So you're not hearing the pumping, you're hearing the valves slapping closed. And doctors want to hear a nice, clear, snapping sound. If there's any extra sounds, and we talked about this very briefly yesterday, that's a heart murmur. So a heart murmur is when there are extra sounds in the heart other than the love depth. It can be caused by leaky valves or like I said, hole in the septum or something like that. All those things can potentially cause extra sounds to appear. So when someone's listening to your heart, they're listening for that exact thing. Nice coordinated love dub. Okay, where does that appear? Describe each part. Sure. So the love, not love. Lub. So what you're really hearing is the valve slap. Normally, by the way, we would get out the stethoscopes and listen to our hearts. I kind of feel bad saying that. I'm not using any of that stuff, but... <sighs> kind of a bummer. You guys good? Yeah? Cool. I'll post this as well. Okay, so we talked about electrical activity. Um, okay, I'm going to blow through this last part here. Noradrenaline and acetylcholine. I can summarize this very quickly. You also have hormonal control over your heart. Okay? So there are two basic hormone systems. Your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. Your sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight mechanism. That's what's activated when it's go time, okay? So you're in danger, 
you're, you need some extra speed to escape that bear, or you are running a race or whatever, that's probably more likely in a modern context than bear escape, but for, you are activating your um, fight or flight mechanism, okay? That's going to cause a release of adrenaline or norepinephrine from your adrenal glands, and your heart can read that, it can detect that adrenaline signal, and it increases your heart rate. It's your SA node that does that, right? That kind of coordinates your heartbeat, right? So your SA node can detect it as chemical receptors on the surface of the cells in the SA node, and they can detect adrenaline, and it increases your heart rate. If you've ever had to inject your EpiPen before, luckily I never have, but uh, my partner has, if you ever had to inject an EpiPen before you've had an allergic reaction, that's adrenaline. Same stuff, except it's synthetic adrenaline, but it's the same stuff that comes out of your adrenal gland. Uh, and man, does it ever increase your heart rate? It instantly increases your heart rate by a very significant amount. Okay, instead of writing a big thing here, I think this pretty much summarizes it right here. It activates your sympathetic nervous system, and from and so your adrenal glands dump a bunch of adrenaline, which increases your heart rate. I'll mention underneath here too. You also have a parasympathetic nervous system, which is the opposite of that. That's your relaxation hormone mechanism. Okay, so your parasympathetic nerves, um, which th this uh, acetylcholine is released at the neuromuscular junction. So that's where your nerves actually interact with your muscles. It's where they're connected to your muscles. That's where acetylcholine is produced. And so some acetylcholine will be released into that neuromuscular junction and it causes your muscles to relax and it tells your SA node, slow down, relax. If you are chronically stressed out, you're stressed all the time. Man, school's so hard or I have a problem in my personal life or whatever it happens to be for an extended period. Often it means that you don't activate this system, your parasympathetic nervous system, and you are constantly activating this system, your sympathetic nervous system. And over a long term, you produce a whole bunch of other hormones to deal with extended use of your sympathetic nervous system, like, uh, what's the classic one? Um, cortisol. And cortisol has all kinds of negative effects on your circulatory system if it's constantly in circulation. So a little bit of cortisol is fine, but if you're producing cortisol long term because you're constantly in a stressed out state, I cause damage to your blood vessels and all kinds of other problems in the long term. So you don't want to be jacked up all the time. You can't be in fight or flight mode all the time. Got to learn how to activate that parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll summarize this below. Maybe actually that's not enough. That's enough for me, but <laughs> I'm not taking this course. And you don't have to have the exact same wording here as me, by the way. Just the general idea. So I should mention that the sympathetic nervous system is not just about heart rate. Uh, there are a bunch of things that get activated by norepinephrine in your sympathetic nervous system, things like increased sweating. Uh, it changes your digestion. So it can actually, it impedes your digestive system because it redirects blood flow away from your internal organs um, into your muscles so that you're prepared for the fight or flight response. Um, there are a bunch of other uh, things that are part of your sympathetic nervous system. So this is not just for heart rate. There's a number of systemic effects that you get 
from activation of your sympathetic nervous system. But the uh, heart rate one is the only thing that we care about here. If you've ever done meditation or something like that, you can intentionally activate your parasympathetic nervous system. So you can reduce your heart rate. Almost consciously, I guess. It's really happening autonomically, but bring the screen down a bit. The box we see covers some of the words. Oh, sorry. Just, I can just move my head. Just put that box in a different spot. No, I don't need a giant head here. I'll just make a little tiny head. Questions about that? Fairly straightforward. You got one system for cranking it up, one system for turning it down. This is independent of that neural control we talked about earlier with the vagus nerve, so this is not related to the vagus nerve activation of the heart. This is a separate hormonal control system for the heart. So this continues to operate even if you've severed your vagus nerve. You still have access to your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous control of your heart rate. So you can increase your heart rate still. All right, cardiac output. This is more just of a terminology game here. Cardiac output, very simply put, is the amount of blood that your heart can pump per minute. This is one of the adaptations that your body gets if you work out. Uh, aerobically, you go for a run, go for a bike ride all the time. Your heart muscle gets stronger, actually gets larger. And what do you think happens to your cardiac output? The maximum amount of volume your blood can pump per minute. If you make the muscle stronger, you're increasing the strength of your pump. How many wants to take a shot at that? Eh? <laughs> It increases, okay? So when you exercise, your heart gets stronger and your cardiac output goes up. So this is one of the adaptations you get with exercise. Here's a question. If the amount of blood that gets pumped with each beat goes up, so let's say that you've done a lot of training, you've been cycling, you've been running, what do you think happens to your resting heart rate? How many times your heart needs to beat per minute at rest when you're not doing any work? What do you think happens? It goes down. It goes down. And that's exactly what you see when you train. You guys may have experienced this before you've trained and then your resting heart rate goes down because it just pumps more blood per beat. So you don't have to pump as many times at rest to just pump the requisite amount of blood that you need so that your heart rate goes down. So that's often a good measurement of fitness is where is your resting heart rate? The lower it is, usually, the better. Unless you're experiencing heart failure, in which case then it's bad if your heart rate is low. But usually, for I mean, in your age group, it's very unlikely. So it's probably because of fitness. Okay, last thing before we talk about some of these cool uh, circulatory system illnesses, 
Blood pressure. You may have measured your blood pressure before. I'd love to measure this right now, but I'm not allowed to use the spiegel manometer. But uh, you guys have seen it before, the, the cuff. You put it on here, you pump it up. Uh, there's a little pressure monitor on it. You let the pressure out of the cuff, and then you listen for the heart. And when you can hear it for the first time, that means that there's enough pressure for your blood to get through the cuff. And you look at the pressure. That's your systolic pressure, the one number that goes on top, and then you keep waiting for it to go down and down and down and down. And then when you can't hear it anymore, that's your diastolic pressure. That's the pressure, the lowest pressure in your circulatory system, and you're on your arterial side anyway. So there's two that are being measured there. One, the systolic pressure. the number on top in a blood pressure measurement. This is the number, this is the pressure in millimeters of mercury, which is a metric unit for pressure. Do you guys talk about that in chemistry, you use millimeters of mercury in chemistry? You do? So that's the pressure during the ventricles contracting. That's the highest pressure that your heart is currently putting out. Okay, so it's when the squeeze is happening in your heart, it's a measurement of what is that pressure during the squeeze. That's your systolic. Your diastolic, that's the number on the bottom. Oh, when I say the pressure, I mean the pressure in the artery. That's probably important to mention where, where I'm measuring it. It's in the artery or arteries. So this diastolic, the number on the bottom, is the pressure that you can measure when the ventricles are just chilling, when they're relaxing. Anyone know what just like an average blood pressure is for a person? Do you know what it is? 120 over 80 is just like a typical blood pressure. If you measured yours right now, you're like a healthy, normal individual at rest. And it's probably important to mention that. It's at rest. Your heart rate is probably 120 over 80. Now, it doesn't have to be exactly 120 over 80. Uh, it, maybe it could be 110 over 65 or 100 over 80 or something like that, okay? Somewhere in this general area is fine. In general, lower is better. So if you're able to have a lower blood pressure at rest, it usually means that you just have good tone in your arteries. That is, your arteries are good at constricting and relaxing so they're very good at regulating your blood pressure at rest and so you don't have to add additional pressure to make sure that blood perfuses your entire body. Your arteries will take care of the distribution of blood by relaxing and constricting. It shows good arterial health to have low blood pressure. If you have really, really hard arteries, you have arterial sclerosis, then your arteries can't constrict or relax very much to redirect blood flow, and that's gonna cause really high blood pressure. And conversely, high blood pressure causes arterial sclerosis. It's a, it's a, a vicious cycle. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk more about that later. But um, So this would be normal, around 120 over 80. Anyone know what high blood pressure is? Like how high it has to get before you call it high? So the last time I looked this up, and they change the guidelines for this all the time, but anything over 144 over 94 is, used to be considered high blood pressure like at least a couple years ago. I should probably update this. But So if you have a resting blood pressure of 144 over 94, 
And that means that, by the way, that either of those numbers is over that. So if your diastolic is over 94 or your systolic is over 144, it doesn't have to be both. Uh, this is considered to be chronic high blood pressure. It's a continuum. So, I mean, if it's approaching that, your doctor is probably going to recommend that you have some type of dietary or exercise intervention to reduce your resting blood pressure. But usually over that value is when, when we start medicating people. So the problem is if you don't medicate people when their blood pressure is over this amount, it starts to damage their arteries and then it causes um, plaques and hardening to form on the inside of their arteries and then it could potentially lead to a heart attack or a stroke. So. Um, so people generally get medication if their blood pressure is chronically over this value. I should mention that this is at rest. At rest is really key here because when you're exercising, you guys need to pump way more blood at much higher pressure in order to perfuse your muscles and everything while you're exercising. So your, your blood pressure during exercise could be like 280 over 150 or something like that while you're exercising, while you're exercising. <laughs> So that's totally normal and totally fine because you have to amp up the pressure in order to exercise properly and that's not deleterious to your arteries at all. If anything, occasionally doing that and exercising is what keeps your arteries healthy and able to cope with pressure differences. Um, so, so you want to be able to be flexible, but you don't want it to be like that at rest. So if you need to maintain super high pressure to get your blood pumping everywhere in your body, you probably have something systemically going on, something problematic. Okay. I think now, now I actually did cover everything. Any questions about anything before we get into these circulatory system disorders? And then, then we're going to do the dissection once we get through that. No questions about any of this stuff? So this is just like heart regulation stuff in general. All right, guys, first day of medical school complete. You can begin your rounds. Let's talk about some ways that this whole system can go wrong. I posted this as well, by the way, in case people um, just want to look at the slideshow later. Oh, also, also let me upload this note in case you guys are trying to get a hold of it. How do I do that? Here, upload. Do you guys know where to find these in the course notes folder? Yeah. So if you ever need these, these completed ones are always in the course notes folder. Okay. I don't think there's as many graphic pictures in this one. Circulatory system stuff doesn't seem to bother people quite as much. So. Okay. So. This is all going to be dedicated to circulatory system issues. So we're going to be talking about problems with the blood, blood vessels, and heart. Oh, I have murmurs on here. Is this actually on your sheet? Is there a section on murmurs? There is. Oh, okay. I forgot that I put that on there. Okay. So, as previously mentioned here, murmurs are extra sounds. You should hear a lub dub. Those are the valves slapping closed. But other than that, the blood should just be gently flowing through the heart. There shouldn't be any like weird eddy currents or anything like that inside the heart where there's turbulent flow. So if you do have turbulent flow, stop, uh, blood running in an odd way over the surface of the heart, it makes a noise. So it says based on, it's graded one to six based on audibility and palpability. Audibility is obviously the ability to hear it. And palpability is the ability to feel it. You have to have a pretty significant murmur before it's uh, feelable from the surface, but some of them are. So there's some examples on the pictures there of leaky valves backflow happening. Oh, this is a little bit of extra. We good? Yeah. Some of these are pretty quick. MI. This is what's known as a heart attack. So an MI 
is when you obstruct blood flow, not through the heart, so it has nothing to do with the blood that's flowing through the atriums and the ventricles, it's when you obstruct the blood, blood flow going to the heart. That is the blood that is feeding the heart muscle tissue. So when blood gets pumped out of the atrium, I'm actually going to jump back here really quickly to my other note. So if you remember, way back here, blood gets pumped from the left ventricle, and then it goes out through this little valve, and then it goes up into the aorta, right? This all sounds familiar. Once it does that, it falls back a little bit against this valve. Okay, this is the bicuspid. And there is a little tiny, right on the side here, a little tiny opening right above the bicuspid where blood flows back to the heart muscle tissue. So that's actually where the coronary artery exits the heart, which is this. Oh, why did it do that? That's annoying. Sorry. That is where these arteries right here branch into the heart right there. So those are the coronary arteries, the arteries that feed the heart muscle tissue. If you block those arteries, then the heart muscle tissue does not have access to oxygen, and it dies. So uh, we'll talk about some of the mechanisms of blocking later, but it's basically when plaque or a blood clot is flowing through your blood and it just gets lodged into those smaller arteries that are in the heart and prevents blood flow to that area of the heart. Those blockages can happen anywhere. For example, you can get a blood clot in your leg or a blood clot in your arm or a blood clot in your liver. But oftentimes your body can clear those in, you know, some length of time that is not extremely long, uh, in which case there's probably going to be limited damage to the tissue. Because, well, as we previously mentioned, if you cut off the blood supply to your leg, you can cut that off for like an hour, and it's probably going to be okay. But if you cut off the blood supply to your heart muscle tissue, it's not going to be okay. So you don't have a long time to fix that problem before your heart muscle tissue starts to die. Same thing with your brain. That's called a stroke. We'll get to that in a second. But if you block blood flow to the brain for any significant period of time, you're going to cause permanent cell damage. So... As you can imagine, when this happens in your heart, yeah, it causes chest pain. It hurts. Um, and there's a sort of a characteristic radiating chest pain. You mostly feel it usually on the left-hand side, although not always. So the symptoms can vary from person to person. Uh, you get shortness of breath because you're having difficulty perfusing your uh, heart with oxygen. Um, nausea and vomiting are common, sweating, anxiety. Uh, people say that they feel a sense of impending doom. They feel like something is wrong, which is interesting. I wonder what the connection is between your autonomic nervous system detecting low perfusion of oxygen to your heart and somehow a conscious understanding of that. There's some kind of weird connection going on in your brain where you're like perceiving that something is like terribly wrong with your circulatory system other than the pain component. That's interesting. And like I said, it's usually due to blockage of the coronary artery. So treatment for this. Uh, the, the biggest treatment that you can do for this is to give somebody a clot buster, a medication that breaks blood clots apart and hopefully will break the barrier, the clot that's in the heart. So that's, that's the main medication and treatment that's used for an MI is some type of clot busting medication. And oftentimes it works fairly well. You can bust up a clot with a clot busting medication. Um, that's probably what's going to happen if you're getting treated for an MI. There are surgical options for breaking clots, but keep in mind that you don't really have like an extended period to solve this problem. And the clot busters work fairly well. So in most cases, that is what the treatment is. More long-term, so let's say you're able to bust that clot. Usually, the reason why you even have a blockage in there in the first place is because you have a narrowing of your coronary artery. So that's caused by plaque buildup inside the art artery. That's uh, atherosclerosis, which we're going to talk about in a second. So if you have that in your artery, this thinning of the artery, you may actually need to put some new blood vessels onto the surface of your heart. You may need to go around some of the clogged vessels or bypass them. So if you've ever heard of having a cardiac or a coronary bypass surgery, a triple bypass, a quadruple bypass, 
you are literally building bypasses, blood vessels, to go around the blocked parts. This is not an emergency surgery. People, for some reason, always get confused about this. They don't do a bypass when you're having a heart attack, okay? You're not going to survive the surgery if you're having a heart attack during a, uh, during a bypass. But, but this is done to prevent a future heart attack, okay? It's giving in another way around the blockage by adding more blood vessels. One of the really cool things about this is when they build these extra blood vessels onto your heart to bypass the ones that are blocked, they actually make them with veins in your leg. So they take some extra veins in your leg that you really weren't using. I mean, you are using them, but they're not essential. And you graft them onto the blood vessels, the arteries in your heart. Arteries and veins are not the same. We talked about this yesterday. I realize we're covering ground extremely fast here. But does anyone remember what the big differences are between the arteries and veins? They have one big structural feature that's different. Do you remember what it is, Mason? One of them pumps the you're right, you're right, but in terms of their actual structure, how they're made. Do you remember, do you remember the big differences? Do you remember? Muscles Right, so the valves is easy because you just don't take a section of the, of, of, the, of the vein that has a valve. So you don't have to worry about that. Don't use the valve part. But the muscle part is a problem because the veins that they use from your leg doesn't have that muscular layer. So one of the really cool things that your body does is when once you put a, a vein under pressure, it just figures out, due to the signaling that occurs, that it's supposed to be an artery, and it grows the muscle tissue in it, which is really crazy. So it like figures out that it's supposed to be an artery and just starts growing that muscle tissue to compensate, which I think is amazing. So anyway, you can take a vein and put it where an artery should go, and then over time it will just adapt and become an artery, which is awesome. Um, so that's a bypass operation, and they're extremely, extremely common. Um, so this is one of the main treatments here for arteriosclerosis that's happening in the heart uh, in order to prevent a heart attack from happening. Um, we didn't do this human dissection lab. So this is a field trip that we used to take, and we used to look at a real heart from a person. Um, but you can see uh, in the picture that we took, on one of the field trips that we took there, uh, there is a bonus blood vessel. That one's not supposed to be there. So if you ever get to do a human dissection, maybe you like take can at UW or you go to medical school, you do a human dissection. Oftentimes the people that are in the human dissection have all kinds of interesting health problems. Uh, the person that I dissected had a pacemaker and all other bunch of cool stuff. Um, and so you get, to, you get to see this. So they had a bunch of bypasses done as well. So there, there's some examples of some bonus vessels. There's a person having open heart surgery, having a bypass done. Are you guys interested in watching cardiac surgery? We could watch a cardiac surgery too. Let me find an example of it. If we have extra time, it's a really cool procedure. This is sort of as an aside. I don't think this is actually on your sheet. It doesn't say anything about a heart-lung machine, does it? No. So if you're having a heart transplant done, uh, one of the cool things they can do is, uh, oh, this person's on a, a heart bypass. So when they remove your heart, obviously when you're having a heart transplant, they have to take a heart out of you, you have to keep perfusing that person's body with blood, right? You can't just leave them with no heart for a while while you like hook it back up. It takes a couple hours. So they put you on a really cool machine. There's a machine over there. It's a heart-lung bypass machine, and it takes the blood from your veins, oxygenates it, removes the carbon dioxide, and then pumps it in on the arterial side again. It's basically just like an, alt, it's like an external heart, heart and lungs. It does the purpose of the lungs as well, which is really cool. It works for short term. So you can use a machine like that for three hours, four hours, but you can't leave somebody on a machine like that for days because eventually the way that it pumps, it damages your red blood cells. It has all kinds of other problems. And so you can't leave somebody on there for an extended period if they're waiting for a heart transplant, unfortunately. So there's the example right there. And it just, like I said, takes over the function of the heart and lungs. You could do that job. A perfusionist is a person who operates a heart and lung bypass machine as their full-time job. Uh, we don't really have too much of that going on in KW, but uh, if you want to work in a larger hospital like in Toronto or, or in Hamilton, uh, you can, that's a job you can get. Stroke. 
Uh, two kinds of stroke. You can either have a blockage, which is just like a heart attack. That's called an ischemic stroke. So ischemia just means lack of oxygen perfusion, okay, or lack of perfusion with blood. So an ischemic stroke is just a stroke where you're not providing blood to a part of the brain due to a plug, a blockage happening somewhere in your system. So just like a heart attack, the treatment is exactly the same as a heart attack, which is that you give them clot-busting medication. You try and bust that blockage apart using chemicals. It's also possible to have another type of stroke called a hemorrhagic stroke. A hemorrhage is when you have bleeding or a breaking of a blood vessel. So if one of your blood vessels in your brain breaks, it will leak blood into the spaces in, in between your cells and stuff like that, and you don't get proper uh, perfusion of oxygen to your brain because of the leak that's happening, and you also get a buildup in pressure and all kinds of other problems that happen. The problem with this is that from the outside, these look exactly the same. So stroke has a bunch of weird symptoms. Imagine all the different things that your brain allows you to do. It allows you to talk and like understand things and recognize people and coordinate and move your body around and feel things and identify shapes and have memories and access your memories and be able to smell things and you know all kinds of stuff, right? Your brain is doing all kinds of sensory processing receiving signals, distributing signals, etc. So when you have one of these ischemic events or hemorrhagic events in your brain, any number of those functions could potentially be not functioning properly based on what area of your brain has been blocked. So you may lose coordination of movement. You may forget your name. You may forget how you may, you may lose your memory. You may forget how to talk you may forget how to understand what numbers are. You know, these, there, there are areas in your brain that are responsible for all of these things. So depending on what parts of your brain are blocked, this, this symptoms for stroke can be all over the place. There are some uh, more common ones. I think I wrote them on here. Um, loss of motor function is common. Uh, unusual sensation is common. Um, uh, do I have this? Maybe I have this on a different page. I thought I had a list of symptoms. Might be on a different page. Uh, but the problem is those two types of stroke look exactly the same, but the treatment is the opposite. So if you put a clot-busting medication in somebody who is having a hemorrhagic stroke, you make their hemorrhage way worse. It's basically a death sentence to give a clot-busting drug to somebody having a hemorrhagic stroke because you're causing them to bleed more, basically, by giving them the medication. Conversely, if you give a medication for a hemorrhagic stroke, to somebody who has a blockage, which is a, a, a drug that is supposed to promote clotting, you will make the stroke much worse <laughs> because you're going to increase the amount of clotting that's happening at the site as opposed to breaking the clot apart. So when you treat a stroke, you have to be very careful to properly diagnose what is causing the stroke before you treat it. So usually when you go in with an MI, they give you a clot busting medication right away, pretty much. But they'll probably do an echo or they'll do a... Uh, an EKG to check on your heart rhythm to see if you're having a heart attack. But with a stroke, you have to be a little bit more careful. You usually have to do a CT, you have to do a scan, an x-ray scan of the brain to make sure that it's either a blockage or a leak in your brain before you decide what medication you're going to give. Otherwise, you might accidentally kill somebody. So this one is a little bit more, um, you have to be a little bit more careful when you treat this one. Uh, anyway, the consequences are the same here. So whatever function you may have potentially lost, due to this ischemia, the lack of blood perfusion, um, may become permanent. So did you, you know, forget how to use numbers? Maybe if, if you don't resolve that ischemia in time, you don't get that function back again. So you may permanently lose that, or you may permanently lose feeling on one side of your body. If it was on the left side of your brain, it might be on the right side of your body. If it was on the right side of your brain, it might be on the left side of your body. Uh, or you may permanently lose your vision, or man, it really depends on where the stroke has occurred in the brain. There's some common areas, but but it definitely it can be really diverse, the types of symptoms that you can get. And obviously, if you have a really serious ischemia in your brain, it, it can kill you. So you can die from a stroke too. Uh, things that cause it. Hypertension, by the way, is just high blood pressure. So long-term high blood pressure damages the vessels in your brain. It makes them more likely to have ischemic events. 
smoking is also damages your uh, lining of your blood vessels in the long term. Diabetes damages the lining of your blood vessels if it's uncontrolled. Uh, it's actually, uh, I don't know if we talk about it in this one, we might, but diabetes is the number one cause of amputation because it damages your blood vessels and prevents uh, proper blood flow to usually to your extremities. So when people get an amputation in North America, like eight times out of 10, it's caused by diabetes, which is surprising. I don't think people know that, but uncontrolled diabetes is really problematic for that. And high cholesterol long-term also narrows the blood vessels in your brain. We'll talk about that in a second. There's an example on the left of a CT scan of somebody with, um, with an ischemic stroke and you can uh, tell that it's not receiving blood perfusion uh, through the CT, so you can tell which areas are affected. And the hemorrhagic stroke is the opposite. So this is a CT scan of somebody's brain showing a pooling of blood that's happening in the brain. It's also causing ischemia, but this is due to a leak. Okay, arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis, two often confused terms. <laughs> To show you how often confused these two are, I talked to my brother on the phone last night and I asked him what the difference was between these two and he could not tell me. <laughs> he is, he's an anesthesiologist, so this, he's not a cardiologist or anything. But, uh, but I will say that even a physician maybe would have to investigate this. These two are very often confused in medicine. Arteriosclerosis is the one where you get hardening of your arteries, okay? Over time, you can get a buildup of calcium deposits in the walls of your arteries. They're on the walls. When I did my human dissection, it was a 65-year-old male who died from a heart attack, and his arteries, his central arteries, the big arteries, were crispy. They were like cooked bacon. They were so crispy because he had very severe arterial sclerosis. So it's a buildup of fatty deposits, okay, which eventually calcify on the outside of the artery. And once you get that buildup of calcium deposit, your arteries are no longer flexible and they can't constrict or relax to control the blood flow to various parts of your body. They can do it a little bit, but not very well. And so once you can't do that stuff very well, you get chronic high blood pressure, which causes additional damage to your arteries. There's like a cascade of events that happen once you get severe arterial sclerosis. And, and as mentioned here, it leads to chronic high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, other types of tissue damage. It is unfortunately part of the natural aging process to get some arterial sclerosis. So you do get some as you age. It's just a natural part of the aging process. However, um, not getting enough physical activity and having a poor long-term diet can rapidly increase the amount of arterial sclerosis that you do. I will tell you that the gentleman that we dissected had, uh, well, we had to remove all the body fat before we did the dissection. That's how it works um, because the body fat gets in the way. And this person was very large, so we had buckets and buckets of body fat sitting underneath the, the cadaver. Uh, and that greatly contributed to this person's amount of arterial sclerosis. So it's one of the reasons why they had such severe arterial sclerosis. Atherosclerosis, on the other hand, is caused by, mostly by diet. A little bit of exercise is, is uh, exercise actually contributes to both of these. And the reason why they're often confused also in medicine is because they almost always come together. So people usually have to some extent both of these. Um, but this atherosclerosis is primarily caused by LDL. So having large amounts of dietary cholesterol in the blood. Dietary cholesterol is consumed but also for various genetic reasons, people don't, are not good at eliminating it uh, once it gets in. Uh, and so the reason that you have high LDL may not necessarily just be dietary. So often LDL can be associated just with genetics. People uh, just hold on to their LDL. Some people hold on to it a lot more than others. But LDL is just a protein that transports fat in your blood. It's a fat transport protein. So the more fat you have in your blood, the more LDL you have to have in there in order to transport it. That's the bottom line, really. Um, and so the, when you have long-term high fat, it can potentially you got damage in your arteries, you get deposits of fat that actually happen underneath the epithelial lining, and then it causes your arteries to become more narrow. So you end up just having like a little hole in the middle. 
Uh, and there, there's an immune inflammatory response that's related to this. It's not necessarily just caused by having a high fat diet though. It's that in combination with lack of exercise and a whole bunch of other factors. Smoking really exacerbates this problem just like it does for arterial sclerosis. So like I said, a bunch of risk factors are similar between these two, which is why it's confusing. Um, and because of this deposit that happens, you can potentially get clots forming on the deposits because of this immune response. Okay, so it's, it's a maladaptive platelet response. The platelets are going to form over top of these cracks that are happening on the plaques, and then those can become a clot that breaks off, travels through your body, and potentially can plug one of the smaller vessels. So it can plug your coronary arteries and cause a heart attack. It can plug one of the vessels in your lungs and cause a pulmonary, um, not an embolism, but what is it called? Pulmonary, well, I guess it is a pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is when you block blood flow to an area of your lungs. They can be very painful or it can potentially cause a stroke. So atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis kind of work together here to narrow the blood vessels. This person right here, oh, trigger warning, has extremely bad peripheral arterial and atherosclerosis. So if you narrow the blood vessels peripherally, so these are the arteries that are going to your legs and arms, eventually you can narrow them so much that you can't deliver oxygen pro properly to your fingertips or to your toes, um, and you start getting necrosis. So you actually don't have enough oxygen perfusion to keep your tissues alive, and this is obviously going to result in um, amputation. So diabetes can greatly, greatly exacerbate this problem. And it, like I said, it's one of the leading contributors to having really severe arterial and atherosclerosis in your extremities, which leads to amputation. That person is not going to get to keep that hand, unfortunately. But there's really not a lot of good ways to, uh, to fix that. Hypertension. Hypertension is high blood pressure. caused by having arteries that are not as elastic as they should be due to previously mentioned arterial and atherosclerosis. In general, it increases your risk of heart attack and stroke and kidney failure. You wouldn't think of the kidney failure, but remember that, well, we didn't talk about this in this course. When you take grade 12 bio, you spend a lot of time talking about how the kidneys function. Um, but the, ki the kidneys are like uh, kind of like a coffee filter. You pump your blood through it, and some things get stuck in the filter, and some things go through the filter. But unlike a coffee filter, the stuff going through is the stuff that you don't want. That's all of the waste products go through the filter, and all the stuff that you do want, like your red blood cells and everything, get trapped in the filter and stay in the systemic circulation. If you have a filtering system like that, and you're constantly over-pressurizing it, you're pushing too hard on the filter, eventually you break the filter. So if you have chronic high blood pressure, you start damaging the nephrons, which are the little filter components in your kidneys, and then you cause permanent kidney damage. So that's, that's one of the potential side effects of having chronic hypertension. And obviously damaging the lining of your blood vessels constantly is gonna be unhealthy for you. So it's gonna cause atherosclerosis. and arteriosclerosis. Um, can partially be treated through dietary changes. Lifestyle changes like exercise are the number one thing here. So if you want to pre prevent hypertension and arterial and atherosclerosis, exercise. Don't live a, a sedentary lifestyle. It makes up for a lot. Being sedentary is terrible for your blood vessels. Uh, I'm going to skip over this part here. We mentioned this already. We already talked about this. Is artificial pacemaker one of the ones on your sheet? No. I didn't think I put that on there. Is there anything on there about pacemaking? Skip. Skip. Ooh, carbon monoxide poisoning. I should put this on the respiratory system. This is kind of respiratory related as well. Carbon monoxide, CO, is very similar chemically to carbon dioxide. The, the main problem with carbon monoxide is that it is extremely, extremely sticky to your red blood cells. So if you had oxygen, and carbon monoxide right next to each other, nine times out of 10, the carbon monoxide is gonna to stick to the, to the red blood cell instead of oxygen. So you can imagine how problematic this is if you breathe carbon monoxide in. It binds to your red blood cells and prevents oxygen from sticking to your red blood cells. 
even if you then subsequently have no exposure to carbon monoxide, that carbon monoxide will stay stuck to your red blood cells for a long time before it detaches. So you can get carbon monoxide poisoning and have low blood oxygen levels. You can go, you can leave, have fresh air, and you can potentially die later because you still have that carbon monoxide stuck to your red blood cells. You're not transporting enough oxygen to your cells. And so due to lack of oxygen perfusion, you can die at a later time. Now, when I say later time, I mean like, you know, within 24, 48 hour period. I'm not talking about like weeks later or anything, but, uh, but it does very, very preferentially bind to your red blood cells over oxygen. So you guys have probably heard of people dying from carbon monoxide poisoning. It is a product of combustion. So your furnace makes a little carbon monoxide. Even when you burn a candle, it makes a little bit of carbon monoxide, just a tiny little bit. But obviously you don't want to be combusting a lot of things inside of your house for this purpose. Furnaces, modern gas furnaces, if you have one in your house, have a really, really cool mechanism for preventing carbon monoxide from coming into your house. It's actually a closed loop where the place, the combustion chamber is not directly connected to your home. And there are a bunch of backflow um, mechanisms to prevent the actual combustion gases from making it back into your house. But regardless, you do need to have a carbon monoxide detector in your home. Hopefully you have one, they're required by law, but hopefully you have one in your house. Uh, because if you have any type of combustion happening in your house at all, including with a furnace or a hot water heater, you can potentially get a buildup of carbon monoxide. It has no smell, it is invisible, and the symptoms are insidious. They sneak up on you. So you don't necessarily notice. You're not going to sit around and be like, I detect carbon monoxide in my home. There's really no way to know that it's happening until, again, you may experience things like drowsiness, confusion, dizziness, a headache. These are not out of the ordinary for people to get on a regular basis. Oh, you're at your house and you have a headache? Yeah, you're not going to assume it's carbon monoxide probably, I would assume. Or it's, it's bedtime, you're about to get into bed and you feel drowsy. Yeah, that's a normal part of being alive. So a lot of times people don't notice these symptoms because they just are normal things that they experience in their life, especially near bedtime. So you gotta have a carbon monoxide detector. Really the only treatment for this is giving somebody pure oxygen. So you give them pure oxygen, sometimes they put people in a hyperbaric chamber to give them extra pressure of oxygen. And then over time, that carbon monoxide will release from your red blood cells and you'll start perfusing oxygen again. But it takes a while. It takes a while. It can be really dicey for people that are exposed to CO. Oh, and this is just mentioning this idea here of carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, that is when carbon monoxide is bound to hemoglobin. It forms a very, very tight chemical bond. Okay, last one that's on your sheet is probably varicose veins, right? Are they on there? Okay, so we talked previously about this idea of valves, right? Blood goes up in the vein, falls back on a valve. Up a little bit, falls back on a valve. Up a little bit, falls back on a valve. Varicose veins happen when, due to some hormonal factors, it's usually related to hormones, you start getting flexible um, veins. This often, often happens to women uh, during pregnancy because a lot of the hormones that are released during pregnancy are designed specifically to loosen and make tissues more lax, increase flexibility. Because during the childbirthing process, you have to push a large object through a tiny opening. And in order to get that large object through a tiny opening, you have to make things stretch quite a bit. So in order to make that possible, there are, is a bunch of hormone signaling that happens in the lead up to pregnancy to make those tissues really soft and pliable. That's part of being pregnant. And so it also happens to make your blood vessels quite a bit more pliable. And you can get where those valves are located, a little bit of loosey-goosey sort of flexibility, which can cause um, sagging at the valve, which eventually, if you have long-term sagging at the valve, it actually causes new blood vessels to be grown backwards from the valve. So if there's constant pressure pushing back against the valve, it can cause extra blood vessels to grow backwards from the valve to relieve the pressure is what it's doing. So it's growing extra vessels to relieve that back pressure. Um, so like I said, it's often associated with pregnancy. It's much more common in, in, in women than it is in men, but absolutely men can get it too. Um, and there are other risk factors that increase your chances of getting it. Obesity, um, it also happens with menopause for women. Sorry, ladies, you get a double whammy on that one. Uh, 
in general, aging is one of the precipitating factors here. So people get them as they get older. And if you have leg injuries or you're standing for your work for a long period of time without moving your legs, so long-term standing with no leg movement tends to dramatically increase the amount of back pressure that you get against these valves, and then it can increase the amount of potential that you have varicose veins. So I guess I'll show you some pictures of what this looks like. You've probably seen them before. Most of these are just cosmetic. So in general, this is nothing more than just a cosmetic inconvenience for people. However, it is possible to get painful varicose veins. So some people do get pain in their varicose veins from, I mean, it is like a, like I said, a backflow pushing back against these valves causing growth of, uh, of um, venous tissue. So you can get them surgically removed. Although with any surgical procedure, there are potential um, side effects, consequences that you can get from surgery. You can get post-op infections. Um, sometimes they regrow very quickly. Um, there is also, I believe there's a laser treatment for these where they can seal off the, um, the varicose veins themselves using laser. I think that's new. Um, so that's also a potential treatment for this, but they are, they are quite common. You've pro I'm almost certainly seen these before. These are, especially in older people, this is quite common. Okay. Did I cover all the ones that are on the worksheet? I think I got them all right. Cool. So those are some illnesses of the circulatory system. Part of the reason why we go over these, by the way, is to give you a base now for the assignment, which is that you're, again, you're going to investigate a medical technology. You can pick a technology used for treatment of one of these things or detection of one of these things. Um, we'll talk about that more in the second block. So I think in block two, I'm, I'm going to stop now. I don't have anything else for you guys to do, I don't think. Let's double check. break I've been talking forever yeah that's it if you want to watch the vid video on uh, advanced reading EKGs you can you can by the way EKG ECG same thing the ECG the electrocardiogram was invented in Germany and cardio is spelled with a K in German which is why where the EKG comes from and so sometimes we just call it EKG here too but ECG is cardiogram is spelled with a C and it's exactly the same thing so if you're interested, you can watch that. Um, but I'll give you guys a break now. You can just chill for a bit. If you want to actually get started with your lunch early, go ahead. Um, right after the break, we'll get started with the fetal pig dissection. And I think because of the timing of this, I'm going to give you some time tomorrow to work on your project as well, just so you know. So we'll, I'm definitely over time. So Okay, for you guys at home, I will see you at 11.15. And uh, bring a strong stomach because we're cutting in a pig. A little bit bigger than normal. Here we go. I might have to back my camera off this thing a touch so you can see it properly. Oh yeah, they're pretty big. They're um, they are fetal, so they're unborn, but they uh, they're pretty close to term though. If you measure these and you and you check them on like a size chart, they're, they're, this is only just maybe like a couple of weeks before birth, so they're, they're pretty far along with these guys. Which is why they're so big. They and they have they have really good organ development, so it's pretty easy to see their organs. Okay. Well, I really hope I don't get any of this on my webcam. Gross. So I uh, probably don't need to get into the external anatomy too much. Uh, very much like a human. These guys have all the bits. Oh, I'll look in a sec. I don't know if it's male or female. But I'm just really quickly going to try and adjust this. I think I'm going to have to make this higher. That cable wasn't dangling right into it. Is that kind of sort in focus? It's not the best, eh? A little bit higher. 
probably isn't exactly the right thing to use for this, but that's what I got. There we go. I wish I had like a light that I could just shine on this. What's that? Um, can I open the windows now? The Absolutely. Right Absolutely. <laughs> what do I say? Absolutely. Anytime you need to open it, go for it. Okay, just for a light. Huh. I'm not sure. If I turn this light off up in the front, does this make it like impossible to see the screen if I do this? Or is that you guys are still okay for the screen? That's all right. Is that all right? Okay. All right, so external anatomy, like, like I said, just like a reg just like a person, basically. Um, this is, you can see the umbilicus right here, so this is definitely a fetal pig. And this is a male, I think, male, or your penis male. Oh, no. Oh, yes? No. I just see anus. This should be male. Where is... I don't think they've, they've it's got uh, sexual organs descended here. It's you. Yes. It's a ninny. It's below the umbilicus for sure. Okay, why am I not seeing it here? Maybe I... Maybe I'm doing a bad job. Maybe that... It's just anus. Huh. All right. This pig is missing something important down here. Let me see that procedure. You got it open? Like sexing a pig is like. I think I'm pretty sure this is a male. Only one opening at the back. Something important. It's below that. Okay, well, let's keep going. So I'm just going to tie down the legs here and the arms so that it's a little bit easier to see what's going on in the center. And we'll talk a little bit about some anatomical terms. So, some apologies, I'm going to break some bones here. Sometimes I make some sounds that are kind of gross. <laughs> stuff up so we can see a little bit better. Cool. It's got a lot of loose tissue on the outside that's getting all over the place. There we go. Okay, you got the bottom, the top. Break it. Look at that. It's so flexible.
I would have got this set up during lunch, but fairly certain you wouldn't want this out here while you were eating. So just a little delay, no big deal. Okay, here we go. All right, so anatomical terminology. Let's talk about it a little bit. Um, towards the back, like towards the pig's back, going around this way, you call that dorsal. When you're talking about anatomical terms. So if something is more dorsal, it's more towards the back. And if it's ventral, it's more towards the front. So go more dorsal, go more dorsal, go more dorsal, go more ventral, go more ventral, go more ventral. We talked about some other anatomical terms yesterday. We talked about superior and inferior, right? So superior means further up towards the head. Inferior means further down towards the tail or bottom, feet, okay? So superior, inferior, when you're cutting, cut a superior to inferior line. It goes like this. Um, what else? Um, away from the midline, no matter where your midline is, is lateral so going lateral goes means away from the midline and cutting more medial medial means cut towards the middle line okay so i'm going to make a cut in the center of this guy I'm, this is first right it's, it's a it's a ventral cut right like superior to inferior yep okay so there's a superior to inferior cut i'm going to make right here okay, super deep because i also want to show you guys Oh, it might be a little gooey too, sorry. It's been sitting in preservative for a while. So okay, just as we go through the fascia here, you'll notice there is a layer of skin on the outside. Okay, and then right below that is a layer of fat and nerve and fascia tissue right underneath. That's like the clear layer underneath. And you guys have that too. Yes. How do you open the window? How do you open the window? <laughs> you, uh, you push down on that clip. This way? Yeah. You like grip it like yeah. until it clicks and then pull. There you go. Uh -huh. I have to do the outside one too. Okay, I'm going to cut a little bit more here. I just went through the fascia. I got to go a little bit deeper. I just replaced this scalpel blade so it is sharp as heck. Okay, so we're now we're through the abdominal cavity. So, you guys see this on the screen? Yeah. So, down here is the abdominal cavity. This is where you're going to find all your digestive system components. Oh, she's real wet. Okay, I'm going to have to... I think once I get this open, I'm going to have to pop into the lab and pour some of this down the sink. Oh, actually, I can use that sink right there. But you'll notice that at the top of the abdominal cavity here, it's kind of a little bit hard to see. Let me pour this guy out. Let, let me pour this guy out. We'll get some of the juice out of there and I'll be waiting. Let's see. So this is going to go down the sink quite a bit. This is a little bit of formal, but... Feel. in the lab. Oh no, really? My pig came undead. Don't escape. Sorry. Guess I didn't do a very good knot. posting this video on YouTube, people would be like, what is going on over there? Gross. Some of this guy's skin is coming off. Come on. Uh, come on, give me a break here. Sorry, tying a wet string through gloves is not the easiest thing in the world here. I shouldn't complain. I feel like surgeons do this probably like literally all the time, but they have better gloves. 
much better if they'll stay closer. Stick to their fingers. string long enough. Okay, so you'll notice now when you look in here, it's a little bit hard to see, but if I go to the top here of the abdominal cavity up here, there's actually, there's a top and it's sealed on the inside. So this, this is a closed cavity right here. Uh, and then there is a muscle that separates the abdominal cavity from the thoracic cavity, which is what? You guys remember what that muscle is? I can put my finger right against it right here. You use it to breathe. It's your breathing muscle. Diaphragm. diaphragm. Okay, so the diaphragm muscle's right there. Uh, I'm pointing it out right now because once I clip this, it's, it's pretty fragile, and I think it'll just tear, and you won't be able to see it afterwards. But it is here, so there, there is like a, there's a barrier, I can feel it right there. So you do have two completely separate cavities, your abdominal cavity and your thoracic cavity, and there's a barrier in between. So there's not like flow going in between those two cavities. So we're going to get to the um, abdominal stuff in a second. Did you say you wanted to do some cutting? I'm first. You sure? You don't want to go first? Okay. Totally up to you. Find out. Take okay, gloves on. So I'm going to get you to make um, a couple cuts here. It's a little easier to do it, I think, with the scissors. So I'll let you use these. And I'm going to get you to make a cut. I need some uh, instructions on this. Cause... Yeah, absolutely. Yep, I'm going to get you to make a cut right here. So medial to lateral, up this way. You just want to cut the fascia and the skin. Same thing on this side. And then across the abdominal cavity, across the top, right underneath. So right in here is the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. So you want to cut right below that. You're going to cut a medial to lateral cut, medium to lateral cut. Okay. So there and there? Yep, that's right. You're like cutting like flaps okay. so we can take a peek inside. So like making a castle eye. It's tough. It's pretty strong. Tissue is pretty strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like rubber. Yep. Yeah, it's quite rubber. Is that good or? Uh, how far did you go? Keep going. You can go all the way down, kind of like to the side. Right to the side. That's hair. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit hairy. And then here? So yeah, at the top of the abdominal cavity, yep. You're going to go from medial all the way to lateral. Pretty much as far lateral as you can go before you start going medial again on the other side. Gross. Yep, yep, that's good. And you can actually, you can cut the fascia underneath too. So you got the skin, but you want to cut oh, that fascia too. I didn't want to cut any organs. So I, I completely understand. <laughs> Pink goo on everything. I did really ask. What? Nope. Uh, where is it? Yep. Nope. That's good. Okay. I'll, I'll cut the umbilicus away. Okay. That's fine. But just the same thing on the other side. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna open it right up so everybody can see inside the abdominal cavity, and then we're gonna take a look at the digestive organs. I'm gonna get somebody to cut the thoracic cavity too. Who else was in? You wanna come down? I'll get you to cut the thoracic one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hope you're not wearing your finest clothes. Awesome. Oh, that yep, that's perfect. That's perfect. So I'm just going to trim the umbilicus off there. That's great. Thank you. you get a feel for what that feels. I'm just, I'm just trimming the umbilicus a little bit here, and I'm just going to just give a little bit more of this tissue away. It's pretty rubbery. Your fascia feels pretty much the same to cut, pretty close. And I only know that because of human dissection, by the way, not just <laughs> not in my spare time or anything. Put those flaps down so we can see inside. All right, and then I don't know if you guys can see this on the video too. This is the umbilicus from the outside. And its attachment point on the inside, we've trimmed it away, but on the inside, it's actually connected here, I don't know if you guys can see this down here. Let me see if I can probe up. Do you guys see this little vessel right here? This thing? So this is one of the main arteries in the body. It's one of the uh, ascending and descending arteries that goes through the center of the body. 
and that's fed by the umbilicus. So while it's inside, its main artery and vein is being perfused by the blood that's coming through the umbilical cord because it's not doing any of its own perfusion. So it's kind of on a heart-lung bypass machine too, although its heart is beating. So it does have internal circulation powered by its own heart, but no respiration, no uh, ventilation rather. Okay, come on down. I'm gonna get you to cut the thoracic cavity on top before we start getting into these organs. So this is a little bit tougher. Um, I would recommend using the scissors. And what I'm gonna get you to do is start by making a ventral cut. So ventral is right along the midline. Up here, you might hit rib. So when you're hitting bone, you're gonna to have to cut your bones a little bit, uh, kind of gross, but you're gonna cut up through the, the wall here. Try not to go too deep, because we don't wanna like cut away the heart or the tissue underneath. So you just wanna cut this layer on the top here. Okay, so you're gonna go up all the way up, up until about here, okay? And then you're gonna make another cut here and a cut here on this side so that we can really open the thoracic cavity up. All right, do your best. And you're holding the scissors exactly correctly, which is the sharp side down, which is what you want, the pointy side down. I'm going to go and check out the how to sex this pig afterwards and figure out what we're wrong. I feel like I should be able to see something on the outside, right? Got to be something. I've, I've done this fetal pig dissection like 50 times, so it's a little bit weird that I don't remember how to sex it, but it's just slipping my mind right now. It's the pressure of the spotlight. Keep going up. Yeah, that's the, uh, sorry, can I just take a look at where you're yeah. cutting? Nope, that, no, you want to cut that. That. So, oh, one quick thing to mention. Do you know how we mentioned that the lungs are sitting in a cavity and that if you puncture that cavity, uh, they don't work anymore, right? Because you can't create negative pressure. Just like that glass globe that I had those lungs inside, it's like that glass globe. If you look really closely on here, you can actually see it. Where's my tweezers? You guys see this right here? So this thin little membrane right here that I'm pulling on, this little clear membrane, is called the um, pleural membrane, and it surrounds the lungs and the heart. And it is like a fluid-filled sac that has lots of lubrication inside. So when your lungs are moving around and rubbing against the inside of your body, they don't like wear away over time. It's like kind of like it's all like lubed up inside there. So, and it also obviously seals everything inside. So if you perforate your chest, as long as it doesn't puncture the pleural membrane, usually your breathing still continues normally. But once you break that little membrane, it's like breaking the seal. And then all of a sudden air will come in there instead of in through your mouth. You keep going, by the way. Feel free to cut through the pleural membrane. That's totally fine. Question. Um, how similar is this to like our bodies? Basically exactly the same. Yeah, It's like a miniature version of a person. What's different though? So basically. Uh, the face looks different. <laughs> Uh, but realistically, though, in terms of placement of internal organs, size of internal organs, uh, it's exactly the same. So yep, you're not going to really notice any difference. <clears throat> it's so similar that we can do some pig-human transplantation, intertransplantation, like, uh, for example, heart valves and things like that. They're the same size for an adult pig. For an adult pig, we take them from adult pigs, but yeah, same size heart. How much? They're shockingly similar. I'm scared to like cut too deep. In. You're actually just doing, you're doing a perfect job. Okay. So what you've just uncovered right here, and this is a little bit hard to see. This is actually perfect. This is actually perfect. Can you guys see the heart right in the middle there? So there's the heart. And then beside it on either side, I just removed this memory. There's a great cut, by the way. A lot of people just rip everything apart when they go up the center line. But that's amazing. So I'm just going to remove the pleural membrane from each side here. So there's a little sack here as well. Remove that. We have a nice uh, old pig. So you can really see this stuff super well. I'm going I'm to open this up a lot more in a second, but I just wanted to point out over here. See, there's the lung on this side. So this is one lung. 
over on this side. Here's the other lung. Keep in mind that this is a fetal pig, so the lungs are really compressed. They've never breathed any air before, right? They've, this has never been a breathing pig. So they're, they're pretty compressed in there. They're not like naturally, they would fill a little bit more room in this cavity because they would have been filled at least once with air. And then the heart's right here in the middle. It's a, it's a pretty big old thing. This weird little organ on top here, it's called the thymus. So this is a uh, endocrine organ that produces hormones. It sits on top of the heart. And we'll get into the structures of the heart afterwards, but I don't know if you guys can see these two little brown sacs on top. Do you see how there's like a little brown sac here and a little brown sac here? Those are the um, atria, one on each side. So a little atria up here and a little atria up here. And we'll take the heart apart in a second and I'll show you what the chambers look like inside. But I just wanted to see you to see how it's attached. So this is perfect. Now you're going to go along the inside of this thoracic cavity. Do you see how the thoracic cavity ends right here? And you're going to cut, this is a little bit harder, there's a lot of stuff to cut through here, um, up this way and up this way on both sides. You're doing a fantastic job. Right through there, yeah. So there's there's quite a bit of bone in there and some other tissue, so you're going to have to like give it a good old cut. Is there anything you have to like, worry about cutting through on this? Nope. Side or just, okay. We're not going to be looking at any of the structures in here, so. But it's it would be your the bone, the brachial artery. Uh, brachial plexus, which is the big nerve that goes through there. We don't care about any of that stuff. Not for this course, anyway. Maybe grade 12. <clears throat> it is. It is. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. Mason, I'm going to get you to remove some of the organs. You cool with that? Cool. All right, he's in. Was there anyone else? Who am I forgetting about? Oh, yeah, you want to get in there too? Yeah. I'll get you to do the thoracic organs, okay? <laughs> if you're still interested. It smells yeah. It's kind of funny because I think that if you were to see this video outside of this like COVID environment, it would look like we're doing surgery. We're all wearing surgical masks, <laughs> standing over top of this field thing. It's not for the big. Should we cut through this bone right here? Yep, you can cut right through it. It's a, it, you can cut through it. It's quite rubbery still because it's a, it's not fully properly formed, but it's it's tough to cut. Did you want? I can cut it for you if you want. I can right. try. It's like cutting a chicken bone with a pair of scissors. It's so. So I have a lot of questions, but um, absolutely. when like the surgery happens, is this how it works, like opening the skin up? Uh, not this much. <laughs> not that much, obviously, but like... we got to cut it open, yeah. So when, when you're doing surgery on a human, generally the objective is to cut as little as possible to still be able to do everything you need to do. So if you can do it with a hole this big, do it with a hole that big. Yeah, a lot of a lot of procedures are laparoscopic, which is they cut a little hole, and then they go in with a little camera and some little like micro tools through the hole. Yeah, because the healing time is way lower. There's less chance of getting a post-op infection and a whole bunch of other things. So that's the ideal way to do it. You don't want you never really want to just like blam, just like cut somebody open all the way. But like open heart surgery, like you like got to do it. Right? So. Yeah, then you have to do it. So, and in that case, they got to break all your ribs, crack them open with a big separator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's quite a bit of healing that goes on after that one. Yep, that's great. That's great. That's that's good enough. We'll, we'll be able to. And then so you can just kind of peel it back. <laughs> it's kind of gross. And then same thing on the other side if you can. Starting right here. Yep, right at the top of the cavity. So you can kind of feel it. It's it's like right. Yeah, right. You're gonna cut like right like that, just like you did on the other side. You did a great job. It's nice to get a really fully formed pig. You can see all the organs. Sometimes when you get the really young ones, they're just like a little tiny one. You open them up and you can't really tell what you're looking at because the organs aren't formed properly. So it's just like little white thing, little pink thing, and you're like, I'm not really sure what that is. Here, this looks pretty much just like a person. So, yeah, if you ever get a chance to do a human dissection in undergrad, go for it. It's so cool. You learn a million things. You 
got it. That's exactly what you need to do. Perfect. So I think you're good. I, all you need to do now is I'm just going to grab it and I'm just going to pull it. So you guys can kind of, can you guys see this, this right here? Is that visible? That's the diaphragm. So normally it's just a tiny little thing on these fetal pigs, but this one is very well developed. So it's actually quite strong. So you can see that it has this really strong layer in between the thoracic and the abdominal cavity for, for breathing. So this, this guy is almost ready to go. I, I would guess that this fetal pig is probably just like a day or two before it's ready to be ready to be born. This is like a completely warm fetal pig. So, so this, this, this guy was probably good to go. It's a little bit sad, actually, but can't change it now. Thank you very much for your help. Okay, so getting inside here, I'm actually going to get, I'm just going to point out some things before we start removing stuff. So I'm not sure how well, you, I hope you guys can see this fairly well. Um, right in here, can you guys see this? So you guys can't really tell the texture from here, but it's got some bumps down the front. Bump, 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 bump. <laughs> Which makes it what? what? What is that thing called? You're, you're touching it and pointing to it. What's that? Trachea. Okay, so there's the trachea right there. It's coming from up top. If we open up the pig's mouth. I gotta be careful, it's got sharp teeth. Sorry, I'll break its jaw. Don't listen too closely. We open up his mouth right here. Yeah, this is really hard to see. Mm. Can you guys see in the middle? Uh, oh, my thumb's right in the way. Turn it up like this. Oh, it's so hard to see. Shoot. Does somebody have a little light on their cell phone they could just shine in here? Yeah, that's good. Uh, what's in the way? My finger? Uh, yeah, there. Yeah, there. Can you see right in the middle, there's like a little half moon shape in there? Yes, yeah. That's the epiglottis, okay? So that's the flap that's going to flip over and cover the trachea when, when you swallow, okay? So that's that little flap right there. And you can actually poke the probe in. If you poke it on the back of the epiglottis, the back part, well, that goes down. And I can poke this all the way down. I'm not going to. But this will go all the way down into the esophagus and into the stomach. And if I poke on the other side of that, in the front, I can actually put it down into the trachea. And you can actually see it on the inside here. So I, uh, let's see if I, oh, it's going to be gross. Do you see it poking right there? <laughs> okay, so that's the trachea. Okay, that's the pipe that, the windpipe here for this pig. And if we follow that down, it's really hard for me to do this so that you guys can see it. Sorry. I'm going to remove a couple little things in here. I'm going to remove the thymus because it's just in the way. This is an endocrine organ, so it makes hormones, and it's really not important for anything that we're talking about in this course. So I'm just going to trim it out. It's important to the pig, but it's not important to us. Follow the trachea all the way down, and then right there, right, right on top of where my finger is right there, you can see that it splits. Oh, sorry, this is actually really hard for you guys to see on camera. But right here, there's a split. So that split then goes one way, that's the bronchus. So then it's going to split here into this bronchi and then into the other bronchi for the other lung. You just see it. And then there's also some giant blood vessels here. Do you guys see that? the big blue vessel right here on top here, that's the superior vena cava. So that's going into the top of the right atrium. And then on the bottom of the heart, you guys see this blue vessel under here that's on top of my finger? That's the inferior vena cava. So that's the blood supply coming back to the heart from the bottom. Okay? So we've got inferior vena cava, superior vena cava. We've got our heart in the middle with the two atriums. We're going to take that apart in a second. And then if you look, you can't really see, but behind all of this, that's where the esophagus is going down, okay? So it passes down through here into the abdominal cavity. And uh, we've got the probe out here. Again, this is hard to point to, but it's right here. Is this coming out on camera? 
Kind of, sort of. Right here. Sorry, guys. I, I wonder if I should just push this camera in closer. Do you think that would be helpful? The problem is when it gets too close, like it's designed to be, it, have a focal length, like approximately where a face would be from the camera, like it's a webcam. So if I get it really close, it like, it's like, it, it's like it can't figure out how to get in focus. It keeps focusing in, focusing in, focusing in. Do you have like a, a light that you can attach to it? Oh, I wish I did. It'd be mm -hmm. awesome if I did have a light attached to it. Yeah. Oh, I just broke my glove. I'll get a new one. Okay, that's not bad. That's not bad. That's not bad. That's, that could be worse. You want to come down? I'm going to get you to remove the digestive system organs as we go through, okay? All right, so let's take a closer look at the digestive system. So we, as I mentioned here, this little tube right underneath here, kind of a little hard to see, under, oh, I'll move the liver to the side here. I'll move the liver to the side. I'll just hook my thing underneath that. This tube right here, can you guys see that? So that's the esophagus. That's going down into this little bean right here, which is the stomach. What I'm going to get you to do is remove this organ right here. So if you want to grab the scissors, I'm going to get you to snip it. So the liver is, look how huge it is, like the liver is ridiculous. It's your largest abdominal organ by far. Uh, it does a lot of biochemical processing of your food, and it also produces an important uh, digestive aid, which is what? It injects it into the small intestine. Bile. 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 Okay, so this, this thing is making a whole bunch of bile. I'm just going to, uh, it, it's attached to a huge artery, uh, the hepatic artery, because it it basically is in charge of delivering nutrients at the right time, sugar at the right time to the rest of the body. And so it, it has like a central attachment to the, uh, to the circulatory system. So I'm just going to get you to trim that right there. That's the big artery and vein that's attached. I keep trying to keep my fingers out of the way so I don't lose those. So yep, there you go. And then I'm going to get you to cut it, cut this way here. So this is part of the, um, there you go, perfect. And then on the other side, this is attached to the digestive system through what? What's it attached to? Where does it, where does it shoot the bile in? Small intestine. So it's attached to the small intestine right under here. That's what this stuff is right here. There's a little structure on the back of it. Can you guys see this little thing right here? What do you think that is? It's just a little pouch on the back that holds stuff. The appendix. Oh, your appendix is uh, attached oh, to your large right. intestine. The liver makes the bile, then it stores the bile in a little pouch. Gallbladder. Gallbladder. Awesome. Do you want to trim this right here? Nice. Just cut I'll get my fingers out of the way so I don't lose them. What's that? I thought it was bigger. It's not that big, not compared to the liver. The liver's huge. So. Should I cut the whole thing? Is that enough? That's good. Yeah, you got it. You got it. I'll just pull it out now. That's nice and wet. Oh, get one more sniff right there. Thank you. Yeah, it's a little bit wet there. It's like soupy. So there's the liver right there. There's a bunch of different lobes. And then you can see the gallbladder right there. So that's it right there. Looks a little bit green. It's because it's full of bile. The bile is like a yellowish green color. Once you digest the bile, the bilirubin, it turns brown once it gets digested. And that's why your poop's brown. So your poop is brown because it's mostly bile that's making it look brown. Animals that don't produce bile and don't, don't have bilirubin, like birds, what color is their poop? White. So your poop would actually be white, white too if you didn't put any uh, bile or bilirubin into it. If you do have white poop, there is a malfunction happening somewhere in your digestive system, just so you know. So you should probably investigate that. And that, that can happen, by the way, to humans. Oh, I was going to get you to remove the other ones too. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, just hold on with that. I want to follow the system through. So we got the stomach, and then that goes into the very first part, this little loop, where actually most of the chemical digestion happens, this part right here, which is called what? Ah, duodenum or duodenum. Yeah, the first little part of the small intestine, right? So that's it right there. It's like the first couple little loops going down to about, uh, where is it? 
right about there. So this little section of it that just goes around in a little zigzag right here, that's the duodenum. And it's responsible for most of the chemical digestion. It happens in that area right there. Then the jejunum and the ileum are after, and then they're kind of lumped together where the one ends and the other one begins. I'm not 100% sure on that, but they're somewhere in there, okay? We've got jejunum and ileum. And I'm actually going to get you to snip, <laughs> snip the duodenum right there. This one right yep. Don't cut my fingers. Thank you. And you'll notice, by the way, at the back that these intestines are attached to a whole bunch of blood vessels and stuff. Why would it need a ton of blood supply in the intestines? It's got a ton of blood supply. Lots and lots of arteries and veins running in and out of that thing. So that the bloodstream can absorb the nutrients? Exactly. For absorption, right? You've got to get lots of blood in there to actually get the nutrients out of your digestive system into your blood. So there's lots of connection between the, these, uh, the intestine here and the, and the blood supply. So I'm just going to get you to cut that mesenteric artery at the back. Uh, it's I'm gonna try to pull this away. Right there. So if you could snip this way, I'll try and keep my fingers out of the way. Don't cut my fingers off. <laughs> yeah, right there. Yeah, and you're gonna keep going across the back. Looks like Thank grumpy. you. Perfect. Yeah, it does look grumpy for a little bit. Okay. So you'll notice here at the back you can see the last little section of the descending colon right here. Right? It's got some meconium in there, which is just like leftover goo from the development of the digestive system. If you ever have a baby, its first poop is black, and that's this stuff, the stuff that's sitting inside during the uh, formation of the digestive system. Basically all of the dead cells and stuff like that that are like left over after the process of creating the digestive system. So there it is right there, and then the, the rectum is actually just below this. You can't, you can't actually see the rectum in this guy, but it's a little bit lower down there. Okay, and then anus on the way out. So here, we have some small intestine. Okay, that's the stuff here. And then the large intestine, it's a little bit compressed and funny in here. Normally there's actually like a really clear uh, descending and, uh, or sorry, a ascending transverse and descending colon. But this thing's been really like packed in here. It's packed in a bucket of pigs. So this, this stuff is like a little bit compressed inside the abdominal cavity. So you can't really see it too, too well. But you can definitely see the difference between small intestine. So that's this, okay, by, by the way, Check out all those cool little art arterioles that are running into the small intestine. Can you guys see that on there? Oh, shoot. Gotta focus. Ah, oh, it's too bad you can't see it. Oh, it's beautiful. There's like a million tiny blood vessels you can see running in and out of this thing. So cool. So that's the small intestine. And then look at the obvious difference when it goes into large intestine. It's just like this big honker. It's, it's actually quite a bit. Oh, is this out of focus? There we go. It's this right here. So I want to see if I can find the beginning of the large intestine so I can show you the appendix. There. Um, there it is right there. Okay, so there. Yeah, it is quite large, isn't it? So there is the end of the small intestine right there, this guy right here. And then you can see, look at the appendix, just this little... Looks like a little finger <laughs> sticking off there, and that's the beginning of the large intestine. So they, that's where they meet. There's a little valve in between these two, the ileocecal valve, to prevent backflow into your small intestine from your large intestine, and then this is going to loop around out to the exit. Thank you. Uh, where can I put these? Right here, I guess. <laughs> Just <blocking them. laughs> I got nowhere else to put it. So, um, what else we got here? Oh, there's a piece of the liver at the back. Let's pop that out. Um, oh, and then uh, this isn't really part of what we're talking about. There's the stomach, by the way. Uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to cut through the stomach so you can see what the inside looks like. So you can see the folds on the inside of the stomach, the rugae, which I should use their correct anatomical terminology. Just cut up the side of the stomach. There's a little valve I'm cutting through down here. Oh, it's not fully formed. You can see it a little bit. Oh, yeah, you can. Oh, yeah, you can. Can you guys actually see the folds on there? Oh, man, terribly out of focus. Sorry. I don't have a perfect camera for this, but 
There are these little tiny folds on the surface of the stomach. Oh, I wish that was in focus so you could see that. So those are the rugae where you get the mucus production in the stomach and the hydrochloric acid production. It's made inside of those little folds. All right. Um, you want to come take the thoracic organs out? That's the digestive system, by the way, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's where everything's located in there. Um, what I'm going to get you to do is cut out... Oh, this one is a lot harder. Um, I'm going to snip the heart off. I'll snip the heart off. I'll get that out of the way because I, I want to make sure it doesn't get too, too damaged. Because um, we're gonna, I'm going to cut that one apart so people can see the inside of it a little bit better. But I'm going to snip that off from the lungs. It's obviously attached to the lungs, right? Because it's got to send blood to the lungs. So it's right beside the lungs. And it's attached via the uh, pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins to the, the lungs. But I'm going to get it out of the way here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Well, there you go. I'll leave the inferior vena cave on there so you guys can look at that in a minute. But uh, let me open this one nice and wide. And what I'm going to get you to do now is try and cut in front of the trachea up to about here. Okay, you want to point the end down so that you can dig under the skin when you're cutting. And then you want to cut this way and this way. And we're going to try and open this up so you can see the airway all the way down. A little, little bit hard to do, but it's your first surgery. And in this case, if we lose the patient, it's perfectly fine. So this is like the lowest risk surgery you'll ever do. Is that good? Yep. So then, then we're gonna, what I'm going to get you to do is cut, again, with the fascia and the skin out this way so we can try and open it up so we can just see. I want them to see the larynx too, which is just, just underneath where you're cutting right now. Sorry for the view, eh? I really thought that was going to be crystal clear, but it's kind of like it's kind of like looking at this through the bottom of a Coke bottle. Sorry. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. Other side. Keep going. Fascia is a bit of a pain to cut, eh? It's quite tough. Again, like this, this pig is almost full term, so all, all everything's full form. The tissues, are, all the surface tissues are fully formed, so it's it's pretty, uh, pretty robust at this point. Can I borrow those? Thank you very much. I'm gonna, I am gonna get you to cut this out in a second. I'll get you to cut it right out of them, or her. I think it's him. I don't know what's going on with the sex of this thing. There we go. Yeah. All right, so this right up here, that's the larynx right there. So that's where the pig's vocal cords are located, inside there. And then you can see, it's actually kind of cool, that the cartilaginous rings, they really hold this tube open. If you push on it, it doesn't collapse. It's like a garden hose. So. You wouldn't expect it to be like so resistant to being collapsed, but here, like poke on that. Just like feel how hard it is to compress it. Like it, it resists compression, right? Like it actually pushes back out again. So the cartilaginous rings really work. I'm going to trim this down and I'm going to try and get this in the lungs all in one piece. I'm going to shoot for it. I've never actually got this out in one piece before, but let's, let's give it a shot. I don't normally do this as a demo, right? Like you guys normally do this. So let's see if I can get it out in one piece. Oh my goodness. Great success. This is amazing. Just gotta 
turn the lens off the back here. DDD. Oh my goodness, is this going to work? I'm certainly not ready for. Did you do you want to do you want to keep cutting? Yes. Okay, I'm going to get you to cut. This is a little bit challenging here, but I'm going to hold these up, and I'm going to get you to try and cut along the bottom here, cutting off the blood vessels, but try not to cut where this tube attaches here, okay? So you want to cut the blood vessels, which are these two, and then go underneath the trachea. Wait, like right okay? here? Yeah, you can cut there if you want. Yep. But you want to cut the top one too, both blood vessels. So the, the top one there that you're cutting is the, is the vein. That's the top one, cut down. Yep. And then the one right below that is a little bit thicker. That's the artery right there. Yeah, and the artery is always deeper than the vein, right? Okay, and now you're going to cut this way and try and stay underneath the trachea, which is this tube right here. Yep, you got it. And I'm going to try and pull it up out of your way as you cut. Keep going. We're trimming this off. Beauty. Beauty. Oh, this is actually a lot easier with two people. Can you cut over there too? Oh, nice. Perfect. All right, now right at the top here, right on top of the uh, larynx, can you just cut cut the whole thing off? Right Give it a snip. Yep. Get ready. You might have to hold it. You might have to use your other hand. Just don't cut, cut your fingers off. The scissors are quite tight. Just, just bit me. Okay, I think you got it. Oh, this is going to make a gross sound. Sorry. Shiver. Okay, there we go. Got her. <laughs> Dee -dee. Cool. So we've got a larynx, trachea, right? And then if you follow that down, there's a spot right in the middle. Sorry, there, there's some, still some blood vessels on here. This is an artery right here. Um, oh, hold on. I'm going I'm to trim the artery off. Give me one second. So you can see the stuff underneath a little bit better. There's lots of blood supply, right, to the lungs, because you that's very perfusing all your blood. So it's big, big old arteries. How am I doing for time? What time is it? I've completely lost track of time. I, I, okay. If you would have told me it was like 1.30, I would say, okay, sure. So there it is right there. You can see the bronchi splitting, right? There, there's the split. Can you guys see that? Okay, so it splits into the two lungs. Oh, I'm, way off. I'm off. Where the heck is the middle of this thing? Here? Okay, you see a split into this lung and into this lung, and then here are the these are the lobes of the lungs right here. Side. Okay, I would cut it open so that you can see the alveoli, but they really are like almost microscopic with a, a pig of this age. So you're not really going to see anything if I cut that open. Also notice that now that we removed the heart from the thoracic cavity, uh, nothing in there. So that's the heart and the lungs are the only thing in your thoracic cavity. Other than that, it's just empty. So not too much going on. Okay, we did. Digestive system. Oh, circulatory system. Okay, last part. Let's check out the, the parts of the heart. I'll do my best with this. This one's a little bit harder because this is going to be teeny tiny. Uh, I don't touch this camera too much, but it's like roughly here. Okay. All right. So we've got our heart. Our very blurry heart. Okay. You've got the atrium on this side. Which one's that? Right. This is the right atrium, right? Right atrium, left atrium. It's opposite of the way you'd think because you're facing the pig, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. So this is the right. And then same thing on the bottom here. So this side right here, this is the right ventricle and then the left ventricle on the other side. So I'm going to cut the heart right in half, sagittally through so that you can see the chambers inside. They should all be developed at this point. This, this uh, Like I said, this pig is very far along. So should be able to see pretty much everything if I cut it straight in half. 
my vest here. I don't, I don't want to mangle it. it. It's heart was beating because it was, uh, what's that? Well, it's heart was beating anyway. I mean, it was, yeah. it was, it wasn't breathing on its own or anything. It was, it, it's unborn, but yeah, I mean, definition of life, right? That's a little hard yeah. to establish, but, but I, I, I'm with you. Sorry, I can't show you this. I gotta, I gotta hold it so I can get a good cut down the center. Oh yeah. Ooh, this is the best one I've ever done. Awesome. Look at this. What a beaut. Oh my goodness. This is like something out of a textbook. Amazing. <laughs> of course, your view is insanely blurry, but I'll do my, I'll do my best to point these out. Darn, really, that does not do it justice. Okay. Anyway, here we have the right atrium, right? And that's going to pump down. You can actually see the valve. Here's a, here are there are pieces of the valve right here. This is the right ventricle right here. When this pumps, it's going to send blood up and through this blood vessel right here, which is the um, pulmonary artery. Okay. It's going to go through this vessel to the lungs, which I've cut off. Then it's going to come back in through a blood vessel that enters right over here. And that vessel I accidentally cut off as well, but that is the pulmonary vein. It's going to go into the left atrium. The left atrium contracts and pushes blood into the left ventricle, which is down here. And then when that pumps blood out, it's going to go out through this hole. And you'll notice whoop, it comes out that big tube at the top. That big tube at the top right there, which is a little bit hard for you to see, is the aorta. So that's the super high pressure vessel. I don't know if you guys can see it on here. It's, it's, it's the big tube at the top. See that? It looks like a garden hose. So that's the thickest blood vessel in your body. It's under like a lot of pressure. So it's got to be really thick, even in a fetal pig. The other thing that's interesting to note is if you look at how thick the walls are of the ventricles, that's the right ventricle right there. I would say it's about three mils thick. And this over here is the left ventricle wall. And this is about seven mils thick, maybe, maybe six mils. So there's a big difference in terms of the thickness of these because this has got to be the real powerful one, pumping blood to your whole body. The other one's just pumping into the lungs, which is right next to the, to the heart. Okay. Sorry, I did my best there. This is my first uh, live stream of a uh, dissection. Hopefully it wasn't terrible. Um, oh, I'll give you guys a second. I'm going to, I'm going to clean this up and then... Uh, Let's chat a little bit about the project for this unit. Uh, what we're going to work on in learning block one tomorrow as well, just so you know. I'll, I'll give you time to work on it, okay. Um, preview, that's what I want. There we go, they just added this functionality. So now I can actually look at the assignment like I'm a student. Okay, cool, that's what I want. Okay, so you click on this assignment. You guys are going to make a presentation, okay? The presentation is just to me, so you're not presenting to the entire class. You are going to design it as a Google Slides slideshow, or really whatever medium you want, although Google Slides is probably the easiest. Um, then you're going to give your presentation, but I recommend you use some type of app to record your presentation. Loom is a free one for your Chromebook that works really well. It's free for students, um, so I highly recommend that one. We went through the sign up for Loom on the very first day. I don't know if you guys remember. So hopefully you did that on the first day, but you can get it at any time. Hi. No, you got to record it. You're going to present the material. I want to hear you tell me about it. So you're going to present, you don't have to show your face. So Loom gives you a couple options. It lets you just like put an icon in the bottom, like it's like you, your person icon, or it can be blank, or you can show your face. The face makes it easier uh, from my perspective because it's like a more engaging presentation if I can see you, but you're not being marked on that. So you can just totally not show your face if you're like not feeling very confident about like showing your face, whatever. I don't really care personally. So. But it, it is more engaging if I can see you talk. But um, So you're going to make a presentation that's five to seven minutes long. You're going to pick a medical technology. So below here are a couple things. Uh, let me go through what's got to be in your presentation first, and then I'm going to talk about some things to consider when you're making a slideshow to make it interesting. Um, so let's go through the assignment here. So first of all, 
It's a five to seven minute presentation to describe a technology that's used to treat an illness of the digestive, respiratory, or circulatory system. I meant to say treat or diagnose, okay? So it can be a diagnostic piece of technology too, as well, like something used to find out if you have a certain illness. It doesn't have to be for treatment. Um, so the purpose of the presentation is you're gonna describe various aspects of the technology, including how does it function? Tell me about the development of that technology. Um, what illnesses is it used to treat or diagnose? And how does it treat or diagnose those illnesses? So I have some more detail below. When you're giving your presentation, consider the audience. So think about explaining this, these concepts to uh, a student who is not in this course, okay? Hasn't taken grade 11 biology. That's really what you're shooting for in terms of level, okay? So you wanna include all the vocabulary and everything that you've learned in the course, but you're also gonna be explaining that stuff to them as you go. Okay, that's kind of the point. So you're gonna be presenting it to somebody. Uh, another good example would be like to a parent, okay? Someone who's essentially an adult like you, but may or may not be familiar with biology, okay? Or a grandparent or whatever, okay? So what I'm marking you on primarily is that you demonstrate knowledge of the three key systems. You may only be talking about one of them, and that's fine. But you're going to, in some way, impart on me some knowledge that you have about that key system, either discussing how that illness mechanism works and how it's detected by your device or how it's treated by your device or whatever. And so, so don't forget to actually include that knowledge about the system. That's the whole point. You're going to demonstrate your knowledge about one of the key systems. And the second part here is that you're going to demonstrate the knowledge of the function, history, and importance of your selected technology. Okay, you must include a research document. So, going back here, I have a sample research sheet available. You can just make a copy of this if you want. But what you need to have is a full APA citation source on your research document. And then, on the other side of your table, you're going to show me what you got from that source in point form. This should be created when you're doing the research part of your project, okay? It shouldn't be, I learned this thing, I put it in my presentation. I learned this thing, I put it in my presentation. Because that leads to plagiarism, okay? It definitely leads to copying and pasting stuff directly from the internet. The idea behind a research project is that you're going to compile things that you found out, and then from the things that you found out, you're going to compile your presentation. And adding that extra step in there is going to prevent you from plagiarizing. Okay, it's going to force you to put things into your own words because you're not going to be writing, copying, and pasting things in here. You're going to be writing down in point form the things you learned from that source. That's the whole point. Okay, you need at least two sources, and you need to have this research sheet. Okay, You can't turn the presentation in without having a research sheet attached, so you must have this. Okay, like I said, you're going to record a video of your presentation. Your presentation should fo uh, follow the guidelines of giving a good presentation or whatever. We're going to go th through them in a second together. Hopefully I don't run out of time. So here is sort of a basic outline of what should be on your slides. It doesn't have to be exactly like this word for word. And you can easily have more slides than this. For example, if you want to have three slides for the development of your technology or five slides, that's totally fine. This is just a general layout or procession for your for your presentation, okay? So you need to make sure you're including all of these things, but having this exact thing on this exact slide is not necessary, okay? So this goes through and talks about, for example, you're gonna discuss the technological development, and it mentions some things that you should consider when you're discussing the development. How does your technology work? Find a schematic of your technology. Actually tell me how the technology functions, okay? Break down the functioning of your technology. And then, the last part here is you're going to tell me about how it interacts with the system that you've chosen. So how is it imaging that system? How is it being used to treat that specific illness? What are the symptoms of that specific illness? How does that illness affect the body? How is this interacting with that illness in order to actually diagnose it? Okay, so you're going to discuss the illness that you've chosen or illnesses, if there are two or three or whatever. If there's more, if, there, if this is something that's used to diagnose like 10 different things or treat 10 different things, pick two or three and discuss them, okay? So you're going you're gonna to talk about the interaction between specific systems and illnesses within those systems. And lastly, you need a works cited section. Don't forget that when you're submitting, you need a link to your presentation, preferably with Loom, although you can use any app you'd like, and you must attach a research document. Okay, very quickly, I'm going to go through 
some tips for creating a good presentation. I haven't done these yet, is that correct? I may have done them in another course you've taken with me. It's the same slideshow. Okay, I'm gonna run through these real quick. Use bullets, don't put sentences on your presentation. You are going to tell me the information. The purpose of this is that you're demonstrating to me your understanding of your topic. If you're reading it, you're not demonstrating to me an understanding of your topic. You're demonstrating to me your ability to read. I, I'm 100% sure that you can all read, okay? I need you to demonstrate to me that you understand this topic. So bullets please only, just bullets. Put some graphics in there. It makes it way more interesting to watch. This is just a personal preference, okay? I have to watch 32 of these. I would really love to see if it was not just text. Please, give me some cool pictures. Please pick a readable font size. This is not as big of a deal in this case because you're videotaping like your screen and I'll be able to read it no matter what. But normally if you're giving this in front of a class, you'd want to consider having text large enough for you to read. Don't use weird color schemes, please. Uh, this makes it impossible to read what's on your slides, so don't do this. Uh, put things in the correct order. So, um, I gave you an order, a general procession for the topics that you're going to discuss, use it. Okay? Just go along that general procession, it makes it way easy for me to mark, and I won't miss something that you put in your presentation as long as you follow the correct order. Check your spelling, okay? Have a look over things before you submit and make sure you actually have everything you need to in your project. A lot of people in the previous projects have lost significant marks from just simply not reading what's required. So they just left a big piece of it out. If you leave a big piece of it out, you don't get marks for that part that you left out, okay? So just check to make sure that you have everything you need to include. Don't need to put lots of animations and transitions, and you should have a citation slide at the end with your research sheet. Any questions in here about the project before you go? We're going to work on this in Block A tomorrow. I just wanted to get that out of the way in case anyone wanted to get started early. The quiz is today. Do it anytime you like. It's 53 questions, I believe. For the section that's check all that apply, please check all that apply. And don't just check the first one you see and be like, yep, that's true. Got to make sure you check all those, otherwise you won't get the mark for it. Okay, and it's open book. Take your time. Take your time. Two and a half hours is a lot of time to finish this, okay? Take your time. Use your notes. All right, guys. Good luck. I'll see you guys at home tomorrow.